Good morning, everyone. My name is Council Member Stephen Levin. I'm Chair of the Committee on General Welfare, and I want to thank everybody for coming out this morning for today's important oversight hearing entitled DOE's Support for Homeless Students. In February 2016, the Committee on Education and General Welfare previously held a hearing on homeless students, and I'd like to thank Council Member Danny Drum, Chair of the Education Committee, for this joint hearing once again. Today, we will explore what progress has been made to enhance supports to homeless students since our last hearing. We will also be considering three pieces of legislation, Intro 1497, which will be discussed further by Chair Drum, Intro 572 by Councilmember Liz Crowley, a, a local law to amend the Administrative Code in New York City in relation to requiring the Department of Homeless Services to post daily shelter census data by borough, a bill that I have introduced, a local law, Intro 1714, a local law to amend the Administrative Code of the City of New York in relation to Educational Continuity Unit, which would require any DHS intake facility for families with children to have an Educational Continuity Unit. New York City has seen record levels of homelessness, and unfortunately, the overall number of homeless families in the DHS shelter system has continued to steadily increase in recent years. By the end of calendar year 2016, there were about 60,000 men, women, and children in the DHS shelter system. Children under the age of 18 accounted for more than a third of the shelter population and more than half of the people served were in shelters for families with children. Today, the number of homeless individuals in shelter remains about 60,000. It is important to note that this number does not include families living in doubled up situations, which means that the overall number of homeless students, according to the McKinney-Vento Act, is significantly higher. And if you saw today's New York Times, um, recent uh, data is showing that one in 10 children in the New York City school system uh, over the past year experienced homelessness according to the McKinney-Vento definition. During the 2015-2016 school year, nearly 100,000 homeless students attended New York City public schools, which is a 49% increase in six years, which includes approximately 33,000 school-aged children in shelters and 60,000 living doubled up with other households. Further, the 3,300 students in the city's public schools who live in homeless shelters during the 2015-2016 school year was an increase of more than 4,000 or 15% from the previous school year. And now it's, it's up to about 110,000, um, according to, to the report that was released yesterday. Research has demonstrated that homeless students experience academic, social, and behavioral challenges that result that result in adverse educational and life outcomes compared to their housed peers. In April of 2016, DHS released its 90-day review of homeless services that resulted in 46 reforms, including two reforms specific to homeless students, which are the first, target outreach to doubled up families with school-aged children in which HRA will work with DOE to identify and proactively target prevention services for students of families living in doubled up situations who are reported as homeless under the McKinney-Vento Act, and two, eliminate the requirement for school-aged children to be present at PATH, uh, DHS's intake center for families for multiple appointments. DHS has already implemented the latter, however, School-aged children are still required to be present with their parents for the first appointment at PATH, which means that they are still missing a day of school. Today, the General Welfare Committee seeks to learn about the city's progress in outreach to double up families and how it currently serves school-aged children in the shelter system. Um, you know, on a, on a personal note, I mean, I woke up this morning and I have a, a eight-month-old daughter. And, and to think of what it would be like to wake up every morning in a shelter with a child and what it means for that child um, and the level of stress that is toxic and compounds uh, in their brain and in their nervous system um, is, is, is somewhat inconceivable for those of us that haven't lived it. And, um, you know, when we talk about numbers, 110,000 children, each of those children is an individual and each of those children um, uh, experiences um, uh, that level of stress, and it, 
it, uh, it has such an impact on their lives. And so as we're talking about this and thinking about this, let's keep in mind that every one of those children is an individual with hopes and dreams and aspirations and a, um, and a very bright future. And it's our obligation to make sure that, uh, that we can support that and maintain that to the extent possible. At this time, I'd like to also acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. Um, uh, we have uh, at the end Annabelle Palma from the Bronx, Rafael Salamanca from the Bronx, Barry Grudenchik from Queens, Brad Lander from Brooklyn, and obviously my co-chair Danny Drum um, uh, of the Education Committee. I'd also like to thank committee staff, the General Welfare Committee, Andrea Vasquez, the Senior Counsel, Tanya Cyrus, Senior Policy Analyst, Ohini Sampura, Unit Head, and the Mayor Newshot News News uh, Finance Analyst, and the Education Committee staff for putting this hearing together. I'd also like to thank my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and my Budget Director, Edward Paulino. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Danny Drum, for his opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Levin, and thank you for your empathy and your concern um, regarding this issue. I know that it's, it's deeply, it's very, very sincere and deeply felt. Good morning. I'm Councilmember Daniel Drum, Chair of the Committee on Education. Welcome to today's hearing. I'd like to say thank you to my uh, co-chair, Councilmember Levin, for his collaboration on this important topic, to the sponsors of the legislation we'll be discussing, and to all of you here today for being here. Along with legislation being heard, today's hearing will examine performance and programs that are aimed at supporting homeless students. We will examine DOE's compliance with the McKinney-Vento Act, legislation that was implemented in part to ensure that homeless students are provided with a free and appropriate public education. By law, state and local educational agencies are responsible for examining policies that act as a barrier to enrollment for homeless students. They must develop and implement professional development programs to educate school personnel on problems faced by homeless children. And these agencies are required to ensure that students are not stigmatized or segregated based on their status of being homeless. We will examine the coordination between the DOE and DHS in addressing these needs. Homeless children face enormous challenges and many serious consequences to their physical, socio-emotional, and academic well-being as a direct result of the stresses of being homeless. For example, these children are sick four times more often and have three times the rate of emotional and behavioral problems compared to housed counterparts. Often, children are homeless for more than one school year and are far more likely to transfer schools than permanently housed students. Changing schools can greatly impede a student's academic and social growth, and it is estimated that a child who changes schools takes from four to six months to recover academically. Not surprisingly, then, homeless students in the city generally perform worse on state English and math tests than their non-homeless peers. Graduation rates for homeless students are far lower than their housed peers, and dropout rates for homeless students are far higher than their housed peers. Studies have found that children who are homeless are also more likely to repeat a grade than non-homeless children. Homelessness is at a crisis level in the city, and sadly, student homelessness is increasing. It is estimated that 140,000 New York City students have experienced homelessness in the last six years. Certain student populations are overrepresented in homelessness, including black and Hispanic students. For example, in school year 2015 to 16, black students represented 27.1% of DOE's student population and accounted for 33% of homeless students. Additionally, in school year 2015-16, Hispanic students represented 40.5% of DOE's student population and represented 52% of homeless students. Furthermore, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer youth comprise a disproportionate number of the homeless population and are eight times more likely to experience homelessness. LGBTQ youth comprise approximately 40% of the total homeless youth population in New York City, according to some studies. LGBTQ youth, street youth, experience greater levels of bullying, sexual assault, domestic violence, dating violence, stalking violence, trauma, HIV infection, mental health issues, and substance abuse than their heterosexual counterparts in the homeless youth population. I'm interesting, 
I'm interested in hearing about any DOE programs for this extremely vulnerable population. In addition to the oversight topic and the legislation discussed by Chair Levin, the committees will also hear introduction 1497 sponsored by Council Member Rafael Salamanca. Intro 1497 would require the DOE to report measures concerning students who live in temporary housing, including information such as the number of students residing in shelters, the number of students living doubled up, the rate of students residing in shelters of their school district and borough of origin, and the number of requests for a shelter transfer to be closer to school. The report would additionally include funding information and information on transportation to schools, including the use of metro cards and busing. I would like to remind everyone who wishes to testify today that you must fill out a witness slip, which is located on the desk of the sergeant at arms near the front of this room. If you wish to testify on a specific piece of legislation, please indicate on the witness slip whether you are here in favor of or in opposition to the legislation. And uh, please note that witnesses will be sworn in before testifying today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Council Member Rafael Salamanca for remarks. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm proud to be part of this package of bills today to work towards addressing an issue that is very real in my district. With current trends showing that we are approaching a situation in which one in seven students will be homeless while attending elementary school, I know that my office, uh, we are seeing cases day after day in which parents are turning to us to help figure out how to ensure they can keep their kids in school while simultaneously navigating the shelter system or searching for permanent housing. In many instances, the situation can be very sad, with parents feeling hopeless. And often, there isn't much we as council members can do outside of trying our best to work with DOE to keep students in their own school. So this, is, so this is a real crisis, and one that is quickly becoming unmanageable. In the last five years alone, the borough of the Bronx has seen a 44% increase in shelter students attending school. And it is my fear that if we do not act swiftly and effectively in finding ways to address this problem, then it will become even more unmanageable than it is today. With that said, we know some of the issues we are facing. Families doubling up is a big issue. Additionally, we know that black and Hispanic students are disproportionately overrepresented in homelessness. We know of chronic absenteeism and unfortunately of the academic disparities that exist among the homeless students population. But to best address this problem, we need to be more concise clear picture that periodically reports the state of students in homelessness to we policymakers. That is why I am proud to sponsor intro 1497, which will require the Department of Education to report on students in temporary housing. Specifically, the bill would require the Department of Education to submit to the council and post on its website a report for the preceding, preceding school years regarding information on students in temporary housing. And just to be clear, this, is, uh, this means a lot to me in my council district, given that I have over 29 homeless shelters and over 400 cluster units in my council district alone. It is my hope that we work to get this bill passed before the end of the season, along with the rest of legislation here today, because our children cannot afford for us to wait. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Salamanca. Um, so uh, now we'll turn it over to uh, the panel from the administration. Uh, we have uh, Jocelyn Carter, who's the DHS administrator. Uh, welcome, administrator, for first testimony. Uh, Elizabeth Rose, um, uh, New York City uh, uh, Department of Education, Division of Operations. Lois Herrera, um, uh, New York City Department of Education for Office of uh, uh, sorry. Safety and Youth Development. Safety and Youth Development. Okay. I'll turn it over to the panel for their testimony. Um, before that, um, I would ask you to uh, raise your right hand to be sworn in, please. Do you uh, swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, uh, and nothing but the truth, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Thank you very much. You may begin. 
Good morning, Chairs Drum and Levin, and members of the Education and Gen General Welfare Committees here today. My name is Elizabeth Rose. I am the Deputy Chancellor for Operations at the New York City Department of Education. I'm joined by Lois Herrera, Chief Executive Officer of the Office of Safety and Youth Development. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss DOE's work to support students in temporary housing in Intro 1497. Supporting students in temporary housing is a top priority for the mayor and for the chancellor. Under this administration, we have taken significant strides in both identifying and supporting our STH, and we have partnered with the Department of Homeless Services and other city agencies to help ensure educational continuity, stability, and success for this student population. We recognize that STH are among our most vulnerable students and experience challenges through no fault of their own. We know that for many of them, school is a vital source of stability. To this end, we provide additional academic, health, and mental health supports and services through school, district, borough, central, and shelter-based staff. And we've invested an additional 10.3 million to support students in temporary housing. While we are pleased by the progress made in recent years, we recognize there is much more work to be done and we thank the City Council for its partnership on this issue. As you are aware, the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act requires school districts to take action to remove barriers to enrollment, attendance, and success in school attributable to homelessness. Chancellor's Regulations A101 and A780 outline the DOE's obligations to ensure that these students receive the extra supports they need. Under McKinney-Vento, and accordingly DOE regulations, a student in temporary housing is defined as one who lives in emergency or transitional housing or shares housing due to loss of housing or economic hardship, this is doubled up, or lives in motels, hotels, trailer parks, or camping grounds due to lack of alternative adequate housing, or is unaccompanied, or lives in tr cars, parks, public spaces, abandoned buildings, substandard housing, or bus or train stations, or has a primary nighttime residence that is a public or private place not designed for or ordinarily used as a regular sleeping accommodation. During the 2016-17 school year, 105,133 New York City public school students were covered under McKinney-Vento, 35,067 of whom were identified as living in a shelter at some point during the course of the school year. A student's housing status is identified in several ways. All parents are given a housing questionnaire at the time of enrollment in a new school or when they report a change of address. In addition to the housing questionnaire, we have established, in collaboration with DHS, a modern efficient data sharing system through which DHS sends a detailed daily report to DOE about every school-aged child living in DHS shelters. This data allows DOE to quickly identify students in shelter and is further shared with our shelter and school-based staff, our Office of Student Enrollment, our Office of Early Childhood Education, Special Education Office, and the Office of Pupil Transportation to provide appropriate interventions and supports. Once students are identified, they are assured of the following rights. To attend school regardless of where they live for the duration of their homelessness to choose to remain at their school of origin, where they attended before they became homeless, or to transfer to another school for which they meet the school's eligibility and enrollment criteria. To the extent feasible, a student shall be kept in the school of origin unless this is contrary to the wishes of the student's parent. To immediately enroll in a school, even if the family is unable to provide proof of residency, immunization, or previous school records at that time, and to have a grace period of 30 days to compile the necessary documentation, to receive free school meals, to receive free transportation to school and school programs, and to receive comparable services and programs as offered to other students in the school. Within the DOE, the Office of Safety and Youth Development's Office of Students in Temporary Housing coordinates our agency-wide and interagency approach to supporting STH and their families. All schools are required to publicly display posters informing parents of their rights under McKinney-Vento and Chancellor's Regulations A101 and A780. 
As part of its youth development consolidated plan, each school must assign an appropriate staff person to serve as their school's STH school-based liaison to track the STH population and provide interventions and support services. All STH school-based liaisons are required to attend an annual professional development session in the late fall in collaboration with New York State Technical and Education Assistance Center for Homeless Students, known as New York Teaches and NYS Teaches. Also, school districts with high STH populations participate in the STH School-Based Liaison Institute that provides enhanced professional development and training. In addition, each school is required to allocate a portion of its Title I funding to serve STH students with a range of academic and non-academic supports. The DOE has 10 STH borough-based content experts who supervise and support 117 shelter-based family assistants. The content experts support family shelters within their respective boroughs to ensure that mandated services are provided and that supplementary educational and counseling services, such as tutoring, homework help, test preparation, post-secondary planning, mentoring, and individual and group counseling are readily available to students and families. They also provide training for shelter and school-based staff in order to foster understanding of the law and to share best practices, offer family workshops where students and their families can identify with one another and discuss the issues that they face. Our family assistants are the primary DOE point of contact for shelter-based students and families. Family assistants identify and interview all shelter-based students and families and inform them of their educational rights and play an integral role in ensuring the delivery of services. In collaboration with the STH content expert, family assistants monitor the attendance of STH, work with families to improve student attendance, assist in recruiting the parents of STH for activities intended for them, and refer students to extended day activities. At PATH, DHS's intake center in the Bronx, DOE staff are available to speak with parents, answer questions about education, and provide information about students' rights while homeless. DOE added additional staff at PATH, now providing coverage on Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. <coughs> DOE created a new education guide this summer for students in shelter, and this guide is now distributed at, CAT, at PATH and in shelters. Over the past two years, we implemented several new initiatives aimed specifically to support students in temporary housing. The first, Bridging the Gap, places full-time social workers trained in trauma-informed practice in elementary schools with high STH populations. This program included 32 elementary schools in the 2016-17 school year. At these schools, social workers worked directly with 4,910 students providing individual counseling services, group counseling services, and crisis interventions. This year, the program has expanded to 43 elementary schools. We also established the After School Reading Club, or ARC, a literacy program staffed by DOE teachers. ARC provides reading enrichment three days a week to students in grades K to five at 18 DHS shelters. The program includes reading instruction and activities, homework help, and weekly arts programming to encourage liter literacy skill development. Students in the program are given new books each week to keep. Participating sites also received libraries with over 700 titles each. Through a partnership with the Deutsche Bank Americas Foundation, the Office of Community Schools provides intensive supports to students in temporary housing as well. In the second year of this grant, these initiatives are scaled across all 227 community schools with a particular focus on the 22 community schools with the highest rates of students in temporary housing. This partnership has brought concrete supports, such as innovative data supports that allow CBOs, community-based organizations, and school staff access to real-time data to identify STH students and track attendance, targeted resources such as clothing, laundry pods, hygiene kits, and over 2,000 new backpacks with school supplies, as well as a summer youth employment, a mentorship program, and quarterly professional development for principals and community school directors. We also put in place place new health and mental health services aimed to support the needs of STH. Approximately 60 schools with high st STH populations receive free vision screenings. As a result of this effort, 28,452 students were screened and 4,777 students were provided with free glasses. 
An additional school nurse has been hired to provide more intensive case management and clinical care at 10 school campuses with large populations of STH. As part of the citywide Thrive Initiative, the offices of school health and community schools have a team of clinicians that either provide direct service or work with schools to develop mental health resources where students can be referred for service as needed. The team works in 62 schools where there are high numbers of STH. Lastly, approximately $20 million has been allocated to the current capital plan to construct school-based health centers at schools with high STH populations. Four such health centers are currently under construction and are planned to open in the fall of 2018. We've also increased support to families and shelters regarding all admissions processes. Over the past school year, our Office of Student Enrollment trained DHS and DOE shelter and school-based staff on pre-K, kindergarten, middle school, and high school admissions, and launched a text message campaign so that families can receive text message alerts regarding admissions processes and due dates. OSE also invited approximately 4,000 eighth grade students in temporary housing to targeted support centers at the citywide high school fair and the Brooklyn and Bronx Borough High School Fairs. In addition, families of roughly 1,300 incoming pre-K and kindergarten students in districts 9, 10, and 12 in the Bronx and district 19 in Brooklyn were invited to district-based elementary admissions information sessions. As a result of these efforts, 47% of students in shelter applied to pre-K, up from 38% in the prior year, and application rates for students in shelter increased for pre-K, kindergarten, middle school, and high school admissions. Now in the second year of the, this initiative, the DOE continues to expand these supports. To support students with disabilities living in temporary housing, DOE recently updated its Special Education Standard Operating Procedures Manual, or SOPM, to include new guidance specific to students in temporary housing, particularly around the special education evaluation and IEP review process. In addition, we have provided guidance for supervisors of psychologists to ensure they are exp expediting annual reviews and evaluations for students in temporary housing. Last spring, committees on special education and committees on preschool special education staff provided special education overview sessions to DOE's shelter-based staff in each borough to ensure that this staff can successfully support students with disabilities residing in shelter. We also provide workshops for guardians and parents to help them gain a better understanding of the IEP process. As you are aware, we launched a major new transportation initiative for students in grades kindergarten through six who reside in the DHS shelter system last year. The initiative offers yellow bus service to an additional 5,000 students with pickups from 478 bus stops near DHS facilities and drop-offs to over 1,000 schools. STH who prefer traveling on their own are still eligible for a full fare metro card and the parents of students in pre-K through six are also eligible for free metro cards of their own to accompany their child to and from school. The DOE also works collaboratively with other New York City agencies to address the needs of students in temporary housing. We work with the Administration for Children's Services and DHS to help families find and enroll in early learn programs, which provide full day, full year early care and education for children from six weeks to five year olds. As the DOE plans for the transition of the early learn program from ACS to DOE, we will continue to work with DHS and other partners to ensure the needs of our youngest children in shelter are being met. We connect students who reside in Department of Youth and Community Development shelters with referrals for alternative programs and educational services, such as the After School Corporation and Learn to Work programs. Additionally, we conduct professional development on STH youth in collaboration with Human Resource Administration's domestic violence shelters, and we are currently working with HRA in order to seamlessly address the needs of students residing in domestic violence shelters. I will now turn to the proposed legislation, intro number 1497. Intro 1497 requires DOE to publish an annual report on students in temporary housing. While we support the goal of the legislation to provide transparency around STH, we have operational constraints that limit our ability to report on student transportation as required. We welcome the opportunity to work with the Council to ensure that the reporting requirements align with what we capture in our reporting systems. 
We know we still have work to do and will continue to work closely with DHS and other agencies to provide additional services. We thank you for your time today and we look forward to our continued work with the city on this important issue. I will now turn to my colleague, Jocelyn Carter. Good morning. I would like to thank the City Council's General Welfare and Education Committees and Chair Stephen Levin and Daniel Drum for giving us this opportunity to testify today about the Department of Homeless Services and our work specific to students. My name is Jocelyn Carter and this summer I was appointed by the Mayor to serve as the Administrator for the Department of Homeless Services. I'm looking forward to getting to know you all and working together in this new role after 13 years working at DHS. Over the past four decades, the shelter system was built up in a haphazard way to meet the needs of homeless New Yorkers. Since the 1980s, the face of homelessness substantially shifted from the largely single adult population struggling with justice system involvement, mental health challenges, substance abuse disorders, and inconsistent employment to what we see today. 70% of those in shelter are families, and 34% of the families with children in shelter have a working adult in them. As of October 6, 2017, our census included 22,987 children. And of these children, 14,548 are ages 3 to 18 and in school as of October 4th, 2017. The mayor's plan to end the use of all cluster sites and commercial hotel facilities places and replace them with a smaller number of high quality borough based facilities will reduce the number of homeless, Department of Homeless Services facilities by 45% across New York City. Our goal is to maintain a vacancy rate to ensure the flexibility we need to implement a more equitable borough-based system that takes into account the individual needs of the children and adults we must shelter. The plan's guiding principle is community first, giving homeless New Yorkers who come from every community across the five boroughs the opportunity to be sheltered closer to their support networks and anchors of life, including schools, jobs, healthcare, family, houses of worship, and communities they call home in order to more quickly stabilize their lives. In June, the Department of Social Services Commissioner Banks provided comprehensive testimony concerning the process by which families enter and move through the DHS system, beginning at family intake at DHS's Prevention Assistance and Temporary Housing Path Family Intake. To briefly review, upon arrival, reception staff require about the, reasons, the family's reasons for coming to PATH and are engaged by PATH social workers to provide crisis counseling, mediation services, and referrals to community-based resources as an alternative to shelter. Along with HRA Homeless Diversion Unit, the HDU caseworkers, and home-based offices, these social workers identify services to assist families in retaining or securing independent housing without having to enter shelter, including family mediation, legal services, HRA emergency grants, and rental assistance. In City Fiscal Year 2016, PATH Family Intake handled applications from nearly 18,000 unique households, numbers which have remained steady since 2013. In addition to HRA's Homeless Diversion Unit, co-located at PATH is HRA NOVA, no violence again, the Department of Education, Family Assistance Liaison, the Administration for Children's Liaisons, and a contracted medical provider, which is the Floating Hospital. DHS's partnerships with our sister agencies are important to holistically respond to the needs of our clients. For example, ACS staff stationed at PATH conducts a nightly clearance of all families with children who present at PATH to apply for temporary emergency shelter. Matches are then provided to DHS, identifying families with open ACS cases. DHS staff members also learn of ACS involvement through the standardized intake interview where a family has the opportunity to self-disclose this information. Additionally, shelter staff has access to information fields in the DHS care system that identifies a family's ACS involvement. When PATH staff members learn of a family's ACS involvement through these means, they contact ACS staff on site at PATH or the ACS staff assigned to the family to inquire further regarding the family's housing needs and to assist with service continuity. Recognizing that supporting students extends beyond both the classroom and schoolyard, we have improved our collaboration with the Department of Education so that we're identifying and troubleshooting families' unique needs including their special education requirements and transportation options, as well as needing to register children for school and relaying information to parents in real time. In partnership with the DOE, we created and now maintain the DHS's first ever comprehensive daily digital feed data 
of all school-aged children in shelter to improve DHS and DOE's information sharing to ensure the e educational needs of families experiencing homelessness are met as immediately and effectively as possible. This feed is updated every day to include new students entering shelter and any status changes for current family, i.e. change in shelter or transitioning to permanent housing. The feed provides real-time information on specific families' needs based on shelter location and current schools to our two agencies. Upon arrival at a shelter, families are assigned a case manager in CARES, the DHS system of record. The case manager meets with the family to address any immediate needs and makes appropriate referrals. During this time, there are specific discussions with clients that focus on the needs of children within the household, including school enrollment. The case manager refers the client to the Department of Education Family Assistance or to the DOE Students in Temporary Housing Borrow Contact. We have also worked closely with DOE to improve transportation options for students across the system. And beginning the week before the first day of school this year, DHS provided families applying for shelter at path intake with metro cards to ensure they have transportation options immediately to get to school, including those families who may ultimately be determined ineligible for shelter. We believe training is a key element to increasing awareness and collaborations among stakeholders. Trainings are provided throughout the year to engage the schools and shelter community. For example, last year PATH staff conducted several trainings to DOE attendance teachers and arranged several tours for DOE staff to visit PATH. Also, DHS participated in the citywide annual McKinney Venter workshops facilitated by the New York State Educational Department and the New York State Technical and Educational T Assistance Center for Homeless Students, NYS Teachers, at Advocates for Children for N NYC DOE Schools. Shelter <coughs> placement. In the FY17 MMR, we reported that during FY17, there was a decline in the percentage of families with children who were placed in shelter according to the youngest child's school address. DHS makes every effort to place families at shelters at shelter locations that responds that corresponds to the youngest age child's school address. But due to constraints in shelter capacity, this is not always possible. And this is exactly why the mayor's turning the tide plan envisions an approach to shelter that focuses on placement close to the family's community. As we continue to implement our new borough-based approach, we will be able to create the necessary capacity to address need. Further, implementing this borough-based approach allows us to prioritize placements for those families from the community where the facility is located and then for families from surrounding areas and borough. Since the announcement of the turn of the tide, we have opened or announced the opening of eight new shelters, four of which serve families with children. These facilities will soon be given households, including families with children, an opportunity to stabilize their lives nearer to their existing social networks. The closer proximity to schools will be particularly beneficial for families whose children continue to end schools in the community they last call home. Often, they must now commute long distances, sometimes across multiple boroughs to remain in those schools. Social workers and shelters. In addition to DHS's close partnership with DOE, DHS has also taken important steps to improve educational stability and enhance access to opportunity for those students residing in shelters. Because our guiding principle is community, we believe it is critical to offer New Yorkers the opportunities to be sheltered closer to the anchors of life like schools in order to stabilize their lives. Moreover, DHS acknowledges the unique needs of children experiencing homelessness and the fact that they need wraparound services. In 2015, the mayor and first lady announced Thrive NYC to guide the city towards a more effective and holistic system to support the mental well-being of New Yorkers, especially those among us who are the most vulnerable. This included significant investment to support our families in shelter. As part of this initiative, we have expanded the staff resources needed to help our clients. We have hired over 180 client care coordinators who are licensed master social workers deployed in shelters to work with families as they navigate multiple systems and cope with the stresses and anxieties associated with homelessness. Client care coordinators work to enhance the delivery and coordination of services to families with children in shelter which includes identifying and responding to the needs of students. With the goal of strengthening the overall permanency offering for families with children in shelter, coordinators are working to promote and model best practices for shelter service, social service provider staff and improve linkages to mental health and community-based services. They're also tasked with increasing the, increasing the ability of shelter social services staff to address mental health issues in a culturally and linguistically sensitive manner 
that incorporates strength-based, family-driven, and youth child-guided care. I also would like to note that the agency issued a new LGBTQI policy in April of 2017, which includes directions for shelter staff and providers on how to follow up on the many common LGBTQI issues, including placement concerns, medical needs such as gender-affirming health care, and where to reach out for mental health counseling and support. Through our partnership with the Department of Mental Health and Mental Hygiene, we are focusing on early intervention. This initiative will support families with children zero, ages zero to three who have disabilities or developmental delays. The goal of the early intervention program is to support families in helping their children learn and develop, as well as helping families understand their children's strengths and abilities using everyday activities to help their children develop. DHS provides shelter staff and clients with the information and tools needed to apply, as well as provide direct technical assistance when needed via workshops and trainings. It is worth noting that through coordinated efforts with the DOHMH, early education enrollments have doubled for enrollment in pre-K. Child care and shelter. As part of the 90-day review of homeless programs and, reform, and resulting reforms, the city examined all aspects of the service providers to children and sh families in shelter. During the summer of 2016, the city convened a task force on child care and daycare in homeless shelters to examine child care services available to homeless children and develop recommendations. The task force includes the Department of Homeless Services, the Department of Social Services Human Resources Administration, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Administration for Children's Services, the Department of Education, and the Office of Management and Budget. In the fall of 2016, the city conducted a citywide review of drop-off child care programs. Our task force members visited shelters across the five boroughs and, as a result of these visits, recommended that the city create a new permit category in the New York City Health Code regulating on-site drop-off child care programs in family shelters in order to be able to consistently enforce and regulate standards that assure child safety and su sufficiently mitigate the risk of harm. Developed in partnership with Department of Health, Board of Health, ACS, and service providers, the proposed regulations for this new permit category were adopted by the Board of Health Board of Health in early September. Following that, last month we announced, together with our partners in government and partners in providing social services, we finalized regulations to enhance drop-off care at shelters for families with children, implementing more effective standards to ensure this programming is high quality across the board. These additional regulations will improve drop-off care by enhancing on-site staffing and strengthening health, safety, and physical space guidelines. With these regulations, we are adding training in child development and st standardizing staff to child ratios, increasing that ratio for infants and toddlers so that homeless children receive the attention and supervision they deserve in drop-off child care settings. And we are also establishing strict expectations for physical spacing, spaces, including health and safety standards like window guards and sprinklers to ensure that drop-off child care spaces are appropriate and our young clients are safe. These are the same standards applied to regulated daycare programs throughout New York City. We should provide no less to homeless children. <coughs> Currently, there are 37 operating child care programs in shelter and an additional eight sites that operate on-site DOHMH licensed daycares. These are separate business entities from the shelter programs. There is one site that operates both drop-off child care and licensed full-time care. DHS, in conjunction with New York City Children's Cabinet, New York City Department of Education, New York City Service, and with book donations from Scholastic Incorporated, also developed a pilot literacy program in family shelters. As a result, 30 shelter-based libraries have been created featuring reading materials to school-aged children in kindergarten to 12th grade residing in shelters and serving over 2,000 families. Additionally, in partnership with the New York, Queens, and Brooklyn Public Libraries, the shelters have been linked to the nearest library branch for book loans. The public libraries also provide reading, story time, library card drives, and read aloud activities at the shelter-based libraries. Introducing our shelter families and children to the beneficial programs public libraries have to offer leads them to view libraries as a vital community resource they can rely on after exiting shelters. The shelter-based libraries received the 2016 Library of Congress Literacy Award Best Practice Honoree in, in recognition of our innovative approach to providing literacy services to homeless children and their families. The legislation before the committee. 
As the committee has considered this package of legislation, we want to provide some initial feedback. We look forward to working with the council to ensure that the bills align with the good work currently underway so as not to duplicate resources and to ensure appropriate outcomes for our families. Intro 1714-2017, the bill would establish an educational continuity unit at PATH and every shelter applicant that families with children would be offered an opportunity to meet with such unit while applying for shelter. Currently at PATH, we have DOE staff on site from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday who distribute education and transportation guides to families. However, PATH is not the only opportunity for families to obtain information concerning the educational needs of their children. For families that are losing their homes and entering the shelter system, the intake process of PATH can be a completely overwhelming and stressful process for adults and children. We do not believe that PATH is the ideal location for parents to absorb critical information about their child's education and future. At all shelters, families have assigned caseworkers who are able to address educational needs of the children in a more comfortable setting. This dialogue with families is ongoing and included in the Individual Independent Living Plan, the ILP. We believe this is a more appropriate DHS intervention to address the needs of students in temporary housing as case managers are able to work with the client in a more ongoing way. Creating such a unit at PATH will be a duplication of efforts already occurring at shelters. Intro 1497-2017, the bill will require DOE to publish an annual report concerning students in temporary housing, including DYCD and HRA administered housing. This bill, among other things, will require the Department of Education to report on metrics provided by the DHS Homeless Service, by Department of Homeless Services and Human Resource Administration. Paragraph 2 will require disaggregated reporting on the number of students residing in all C administered shelters, including those in HASA and DV shelters. Reporting on the number of students in these programs may present privacy and confidentiality concerns. The bill further requires the department to report on the rate of placement of students residing in shelter operated by DHS in the student's school of origin and borough of origin. We currently report through the MMR the percentage of families placed in the shelter services system according to their youngest children's child's school address. Intro 0572-2014, the bill will require the Department of Homeless Services to post daily shelter census data by borough. DHS currently posts a daily census report on our website, which includes the total shelter census broken down by adults and children, and further disaggregated by type of shelter. We also report on the number of families reporting temporary housing at PATH and adult families requesting temporary housing at APIC. There are a number of operational challenges that we would have in this kind of real-time reporting, and we are prepared to work with the council on the best way to address the council's concern as the bill is reviewed. We remain committed to providing useful and transparent reporting on our shelter census and look forward to working with the council towards that shared objective. Thank you and I welcome your questions. Thank you very much for your testimony uh, both to uh, the DOE and to DHS. Uh, let me start off with some questions and I know we're going to go to Council Member um, Salamanca because he um, has this, another hearing as well. So right after me, we'll go to yours, if that's okay. And we have been joined by council members um, Maisel, Levine, Rodriguez, Kalos, and Deutsch. Um, Deputy Chancellor, I know that in your testimony you mentioned uh, there were 117 family assistants. What's the total number of shelters that the uh, family assistants serve? It is more than 117. Okay. Uh, so we do have some family assistants who are uh, assigned to more than one location um, and they do go from place to place to meet with families at different locations. Can you get us that exact number later on? Yes. Okay, we'll follow up with you on that. How many students are uh, included in the average uh, family assistance caseload? I don't have that figure. We'll see if we can follow up with you on that. Do you have an idea? Um, it's uh, it isn't that we have. And just identify yourself. Lois Herrera. Um, it isn't that we have a, a specified ratio. It, it's more about um, shelters that have school aged children, and that's where we try to place the family assistance. Okay. Um, what is the minimal edu education requirements for the family assistant for, uh, position? It's 
we are getting that information in real time. Okay. Are there any plans to upgrade? They must be high school graduates. They have to be just a high school graduate, high school diploma. Are there any plans to upgrade that requirement to a, either a BA or a master's degree? So it's a, that position is planning to continue as it is. What we are doing at the Department of Education is we've recognized that the schools can play a much greater role in supporting students in shelter. And so we have actually transitioned some of our focus to providing schools with the additional supports and services to help their individual children. They see these children on a daily basis uh, you know, throughout the school day, and I think they have uh, a real opportunity and ability to work more closely with the children um, in order to help provide those supports. So most of the programs that we've initiated over the past two years really focus on school-based interventions rather than changing the family assistant. Well, with the school-based interventions, um, is that part, uh, are they paid out of the uh, money, for the, the 10.3 million that the mayor put into the budget? So several of those initiatives are. So our Bridging the Gap uh, initiative of social workers in uh, schools that have high students in shelter and students in temporary housing are as part of that $10.3 million initiative. Some of the programs are in shelters, so the after school reading clubs, the ARC, uh, that is part of that $10.3 million and those are shelter based. Um. And how is the, uh, the assignment of these folks determined? And how, I have, I have questions really, a larger question, which is how is the, 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 the application, the use of the 10.3 million determined? Who, which schools get it, which schools don't get it? What is the requirement to get the extra staffing? So the, we identified schools based on their student population. Um, and we looked particularly at schools with high numbers and high percentages of students living in shelter. So, for example, the Bridging the Gap program, um, those social workers are provided to schools that did not already have social work staff in their schools and had at least 25 students who were living in shelter. So at least 25. But I'm aware of some schools that have more than 25 who have complained to me that they have not been given additional resources. So again, the bridging the gap, social workers are all in elementary schools where we are seeing the highest numbers. It's an elementary, it's an elementary shelter. Um, junior high combo. Um, I believe K to eights would have would have counted. We we did provide social workers to some of our K to eight schools as well. Um, some schools may have already had licensed social workers on their staff, and so we were really hoping to support schools that currently don't have those resources. So the school I'm, I'm concerned about is near the um, Pan Am Boulevard homeless shelter. Mm -hmm. Do you know what services have been offered to schools in the surrounding area? Um, IS-5 is there, 102. If uh, we're happy to come back to you uh, offline with very specific information about individual schools. Okay, how many um, DOE staff work at PATH? We have three uh, DOE staff at PATH um, so that we can expand the, the coverage in terms of hours, and they're there from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Is that in the summer as well? It's a reduced staff in the summer, but we do have DOE staff there in the summer. So you have three, but it's down to what in the summer? One. Just to one. Has the third staffer been hired yet? Yes. <laughs> okay, so that person is currently in active duty. In process. And still in the process. Yes. Okay, are there plans to expand the provision of bus services to pre-K students living in shelters? This is an issue for us as well. Okay. So pre-K students, um, we make every effort to ensure that students have a pre-K seat as close to the shelter as possible. Uh, and in fact, this year, we made an offer for a pre-K seat to every eligible child, age eligible child in shelter, even if they didn't apply. Uh, so even though if we mentioned earlier in our testimony that the rate of application increased to 
we still made an offer to children in shelter even if they didn't apply to pre-K and we gave them an offer to the site closest to the shelter that had an available seat. Um, we don't provide busing for pre-K. Um, we do provide um, support to parents. We try to support parents, um, but we, we do not currently offer busing unless a child has an early intervention IEP, in which case they do receive busing. What about students who uh, don't reside in shelters but who are um, temporarily um, homeless? So students who are doubled up right. uh, are, can apply to uh, pre-K as any other child can and should, um, and, and we support them in similar ways. And overall that's true as well, so that I mean, in, in the elementary grades and above? So in elementary grades and above, students who are doubled up uh, have the same rights uh, as students who are living in shelter. They can continue in their school of origin. Uh, they are provided with transportation. In the case of students who are doubled up, it is predominantly Metro cards. Um, they have, can choose to transfer to the school that they are eligible to attend based on their new address. And we provide similar supports in terms of um, their, their set aside in Title I uh, and, and other supports. And what about the extension of uh, bus services to students in conditional shelter placements like commercial hotels? So we do provide bus service for students who are placed in a commercial hotel through DHS. Another question that I have is um, I became aware of recently in my district that uh, there are homeless shelters with, D, uh, with HPD. Um, for those who may have been uh, in a fire or another um, emergency type situation. Does the DOE provide services to them equal to the services that you provide through DHS? How are you dealing with those uh, students? So certainly any child uh, who is homeless for any reason has the rights, the same set of rights to continue in their school to receive additional supports and so forth. Um, we don't have a data feed of similar to the one that we have with DHS, uh, with HPD, um, but where we are aware of a child in one of those circumstances, we will obviously work to support Do you them. know any numbers in regard to the number of um, homeless students in HPD shelters or DYCD shelters? So DYCD shelters, we work very closely with DYCD. Those shelters have a very high proportion of LGBT youth uh, and unaccompanied uh, LGBT youth. We work very closely with them. So can you describe those efforts to work with those LGBT students? So we train uh, shelter staff on LGBT supports. Um, our Manhattan STH office is our hub for working with the LGBT students. Um, and we partner with the shelters to, um, particularly on helping work to provide access to housing. Then of course those students um, where we, where they are in school, we also support through our LGBT work that is ongoing in our schools, where we are working with schools to develop GSAs. We are working uh, on the health side to provide um, medically accurate and gender supportive information about health, health services, condom availabilities, and so forth. Um. Another concern that has been brought to my attention is the coordination and collaboration between the DOE uh, personnel and uh, the social service personnel in shelters. Um, what type of coordination goes on specifically um, regarding issues at school versus what's happening in the shelter, et cetera, so forth and so on? To me, I've, I've heard complaints about a lack of coordination or even a different philosophy in terms of uh, dealing with students who may have behavioral issues, emotional issues, um, and things like that. Um, we've worked with the shelter providers and we have uh, professional development that's held jointly uh, to help foster this one voice um, and training around uh, numerous uh, topics, particularly chronic absenteeism, which has been an issue, so that we can all speak in the same voice and approach families in the same way. Um, this has been going on for um, 
a number of years, actually. Um, but I would say that the collaboration is, is strengthened over time, um, culminating in the daily data share, which we're very proud of, which helps us uh, have a better sense of how many students are in shelter um, and helps us to coordinate our, our activities. And the other thing that I would add is that we do weekly meetings um, with the Department of Education so that any issues that arise, we try to mitigate, mitigate them and work through them. But you do the weekly meetings at the administration level or do you do it at the local grassroots level We're between the school and the, the shelter? At the administration level and then it, it all starts trickles down to the schools and to the shelters. So um, um, does the DOE liaison sit on the community advisory board for the, the, for the shelters? Do they attend community advisory board meetings? Not that I'm aware. I'll have to double check that. Okay, because I would like to suggest that that mm -hmm. be done as well so that um, there is better coordination between the two. Um, that's an issue that's been brought to my attention. So oh, the wait. point is being um, made. To, um, oh, I'm sorry. Council Council Member Drum, I'm just I'm just getting some information that at the boulevard, yes, um, the DOE is on does sit on the cab at the boulevard. I think it probably does vary by shelter, but that does happen at the boulevard. And is that for the IS five school or for the um, PS one oh two school? Would you know that? One oh two. Or one oh two. Okay. Thank you. And um, the um, number of homelessness uh, of number of homeless folks goes up in the summer, yet the number of um, DOE staff at PATH goes down. So how can we better, how can we improve that situation? It's uh, something that we've been looking at as well. Um, the issue is that our family workers are 10 month employees, they're, they're union members, but we have offered um, to- Are they teachers? Are they on a teacher line? No, they're DC 37. On oh, DC 37, okay. Um, and so we've offered, we're, um, for those who wish to work over the summer, um, but it's not a requirement of their particular role. So is that, a per, would that be a per session assignment? It's an additional pay if they work over the summer, yes. Um, in the, your testimony, Deputy Chancellor, as well, you mentioned that you have a housing questionnaire which is established in, co in collaboration with DHS. Uh, how long has that been in place? It was formally called, it was formally called the residency questionnaire and actually it was um, in collaboration with the New York State Ed Department. Um, and it's been in place, although I can't say the specific year, it's been in place for a number of years. It just recently got renamed to housing questionnaire. Renamed to what? H housing questionnaire. It used to be called the residency questionnaire, now it's mm -hmm. the housing questionnaire. Okay, I think I'm going to turn it over to Council Member Salamanca right now, and then I'll come back and, right. and follow up with other Just questions. before you transfer, uh, transition, um, the caseload of family workers is about 100 students per. Per, okay, per family assistant. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies. A um, few questions. Uh, in terms of um, 1497, how does uh, currently, how does the DOE track students in permanent housing compared to students that fall under the mckinnon Vento Homeless Assistant Act? Well, I guess track in what way? How does DOE track in terms of how do you know, okay. how do you track per school, or do you track per school students that are, have permanent housing compared to students that fall under this mckinney Vento Act? Right. So the, there are several ways that we identify this. The housing questionnaire that uh, Lois was just speaking about is one of the ways that uh, we learn about a student's residency, about their housing situation. Um, so every family completes the housing questionnaire when a student enrolls in a school. In addition, we have the daily data feed that we discussed um, that we received from DHS. And it identifies each student uh, in, through a matching process. Um, and so we are then able to match those individual students to the schools that they attend. 
So is we safe to. Have, I'm sorry. Yes. And we have a housing indicator in in our ATS system that indicates whether a student is in permanent housing or is in um, one of the categories of under McKinney Vento. All right. So it's safe to say that this data exists, and yes. per school. Yes. So the data is available per school. And up to what age are you tracking uh, these students? So we track all of our students in every grade level. Um, and obviously this data changes on a frequent basis as student status does change. Um, our primary um, data would be a one day in time, our audited register of October 31st. Uh, we, the data does change throughout the year. And so who's responsible for putting this data together per school? So the school, the, the housing questionnaire information would be taken in by um, and whoever at the school is managing enrollment. That could be a pupil accounting secretary, that could be a parent coordinator, and that data, they would enter that data into ATS as they are registering the child. Something coming in through the DHS data feed becomes an automatic update in the system. Sorry, Deputy Chancellor, can you move the microphone a little bit closer so sure. that we have all your comments on the record? And so once this data is, is put together, mm -hmm. where does this data go? Who, who has access to this data? Does it go to the Chancellor's office? Uh, wh where does this data go? So the data resides in our ATS system, and there are a variety of departments who have access to it for different purposes. Our Office of Safety and Youth Development um, pulls data in order to help, for example, to prepare for this hearing. Our um, uh, research policy, RPSG research policy support group uh, is the organization that does most data analytics for the DOE. They're the ones who would analyze groups of students, for example, by uh, for ELA and math results or graduation rates. They would provide that analytic support. All right. So when I mentioned in my opening statement, my council district in the South Bronx, the 17th council district, I have 29 shelters mm -hmm. and over 400 cluster sites. It's safe to say that my council district is oversaturated by homeless shelters. Uh, in Community Board 3 and Community Board 6, I have over 1,200 individuals whose last known address was in another Community Board district. Mm -hmm. So it's safe to say that my district, on top of it being oversaturated, I am taking homeless families from other districts and they're bringing them over to the South Bronx. Um, with that oversaturation, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think it's safe to say that my school districts as well are being oversaturated. They have to take in these families. They have to take in these students that are being brought in uh, to my council district. Now, would we not, is it not safe to say that having this data readily available and having this data available online will help this administration and will help the council when we're putting our budget together to see what schools need more resources than other schools uh, because of the amount of homeless families that certain districts are taking. And, and I say that with a heavy heart because mm -hmm. a few weeks ago there was a, uh, a recent death. There was a, there was a killing that happened in one of my schools uh, where a student was being bullied. We all know what, what, you know, we all know what happened there. And I met with the principal, I met with the superintendent. This school falls in community board six. And I was told that the principal made multiple requests for scanners, for more school, for more school safety officers, and that request was denied. And so uh, again, going back to DOE, knowing that you can have this data, knowing that certain schools need more resources. Would it not be relevant to have this data available to help us know how to identify schools that need more resources? So we do use this data cons constantly for helping to identify schools that need resources. For example, the Bridging the Gap social workers, w those schools were identified based on this data where we were able to see which schools had how many students who were living in shelter attending their school and what other resources they already had. This data is used by the Department of Finance within the DOE um, and 
as part of identifying Title I allocations for schools that have shelter students who are living in shelter, where schools have to set aside some money, or schools that are not Title I receive Title I for the students in shelter that are enrolled there. Um, w community schools. Um, many of the, the choices that we've made of which schools to support with greater wraparound services through the community schools efforts are based on where do we have schools that are where we have higher needs among our students and in fact the community schools as a whole have a higher percentage of students in temporary housing than the system does overall so we absolutely do use this information um, in order to provide our schools with resources. So I think that we both agree that this data exists. So I just, if you can just please explain, I don't understand what is your, the, your Department of Education's resistance on this bill to have this data available online so that the public has access to it. I don't think that we've it. expressed resistance to providing this information. There, there are some parts of the bill, um, for example, the uh, points about the number of students who have ch asked for a shelter transfer, that's not data that we have. That is data that our colleagues in DHS has. Um, there are some aspects of the bill around transportation um, where some of the data requested is data that we don't currently track or gather or have the capability to track. So it's not, we have not objected to providing this data about uh, the shelter populations or temporary housing populations of schools. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Salamanca. Um, I'll ask a few questions. And so we've been joined by Councilmember Inez Barron, Councilmember Vincent Gentile, Councilmember Mark Traeger, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. I think we already said Brad is here. Dan Gorodnik is here. Councilmember Dan Gorodnik, Councilmember Chaim Deutsch, Councilmember Antonio Reynoso, and Councilmember Debbie Rose. Thank you all for being here. And I mean. Steve, uh, Council Member, Chair Levin is going to ask questions. Okay, so then we'll go to Council Member Brad Lander. Uh, thank you very much to both chairs uh, for this time and, and for this hearing and for the just sustained attention to this work. And, and Steve, I thought your opening statement really put this in an important context. And I want to say also thank you to DOA and DHS for what's an extraordinary amount of work. It's, it's depressing to have to do this amount of work, but um, it, is, it is good to see the energy that you're putting into it. I have two specific questions and then one more general one. The specific one, first specific one, relates to school-based health centers. Deputy Chancellor, I know that you spoke about money that you're putting to build those out at schools, which is great. I'm sure you're aware, unfortunately, that the state is cutting the money to school-based health centers. Mm -hmm. um, I met with some of them recently, and they have some ideas for being able to bill more through insurance broadly, not necessarily just from, from homeless students, obviously, but where there's Medicaid, where there's you know, Child Health Plus, where there's insurance. Um, so I wonder if we could sit down and talk about the opportunities to work with them. They think that might be a source of resources for replacing. So we should fight the state cuts, obviously, but we need to make sure that school-based health centers are stable mm -hmm. uh, broadly, certainly so, and I agree that focusing them in schools with high percentage of students in temporary housing is important. And, and thank you. We agree that the stability for the providers of the school-based health centers really is critical, um, and so the, the a permanent Medicaid waiver to allow school-based health centers to bill Medicaid directly is a very important component of that stability. We'd be happy to meet with you to talk about other ways to help support the school-based health centers. All right, thank you. We'll, we'll follow up off, offline. Um, second, just a question about uh, busing availability for students while, uh, uh, while they're in conditional placements applying at PATH. I know that can sometimes take a week or two, is there busing available for them during that time? Because otherwise they're going to miss those days and have transition. So while a family is under conditional placement, they are provided metro cards and parents may also receive a metro card to escort their child to school. Because it takes sometimes about the same amount of time to arrange busing as it does to get through the conditional housing, we don't pr automatically route a child until they have been approved for shelter. Got it. Okay, but you add the extra metro card, but we're not currently able to do to do busing. Correct during the conditional period. Okay. Um, 
thanks for clearing that up. Um, and then I, I guess I want to ask just a, a much broader question, really, about the relationship to your thinking here to the work around school integration. Um, it, it is, of course, I thought you're laying out of the right and the right for students to make the choice to stay in their school if they want to or go to a school, you know, PS 230 is right across the street from the uh, Kensington Family Shelter, such a wonderful school. Like, I'd encourage anyone who wound up there to go. Mm -hmm. But, leave, you know, that's got to be a choice of the parents. And, of course, maintaining stability makes enormous sense. At the same time, it doesn't make sense to have kids in, in such, to have so many schools, the growing number per the IBO report and per your data, that have such high concentrations of kids who are in temporary housing, who are homeless, who are so low income. This gets to Councilmember Salamanca's point. So uh, on the one hand, of course, we want to provide those schools the resources and supports they need. And on the other hand, it does not make sense to have a policy that further and you know concentrates our, our, our poorest and most at risk kids in a small number of schools with lots of other low income and at risk kids. Like that's why we, uh, you know, why school integration is essential. It is in part about racial justice and it is in part because diverse schools socioeconomically can support their kids and overwhelmingly poor schools can't. So I guess I just want to ask in addition to providing supports here, and I know that the District 1 plan is starting to think about this. How are we starting to look at this more broadly? Are we starting to look at this more broadly so that our work on school integration helps in this process? Well, the most important thing here is that we must comply with the law. And the law requires that a student who is living in a zone it has the right to attend that zone school. Um, and, or that a child, a, let me back up. The law requires that a student living in shelter have the same rights of attendance of any permanently housed student living in that area. So if a shelter is located in a school zone, that student in shelter has the right to attend that school the same way any other child living in that school zone has the right to attend that school. So from a legal perspective, you know, that potential for concentration uh, it is not avoidable. We can offer parents alternative choices. Um, we know that from a convenience perspective, attending the school closest to the shelter may be a more convenient and attractive option to that family than attending another nearby school that's not as close or convenient. We also are required, and many families prefer, and there are many very strong educational reasons why they would prefer for their child to remain, to remain at their school of origin, even if that's further away, even if that requires distance of travel. Um, and we know families who, even when they are placed at a shelter far away or then receive permanent housing far away from that school of origin, that stability, the relationships they have there, the services that are provided there are very valuable to that family and to the stability of that child. So I'll just make this final point and then, and then yield, and I'm not really going to ask it as a question. I, I mean, of course, we have to respect McKinney-Vento, and of course, we want to enable students to stay in their schools, but not to also see it in the broader context of segregation. We, we are violating fair housing laws here. The reason why we want to have a conversation about fair share and shelter siting and the reason why we're trying to push so hard to think about school integration is that if we only focus on this set of issues and continue to concentrate the lowest income students overwhelmingly in a small number of schools, no amount of additional money on school supports is going to help those schools succeed. So uh, I mean, I appreciate all this work and the obligations. but. This, the dots need to be connected to, the, to our school integration work and to a fair share approach to shelter siting because going down a path where we just continue to concentrate the lowest income students in the same schools is not a path for success. We, we certainly agree that location of housing, location of affordable housing, location of shelters is a very strong influence on how can we develop diverse schools. And I, I wanted to add to that. I think um, the mayor's plan that we put forth earlier this year that really moves towards community as a guiding principle, really working on the 17-year-old use of clusters that started under the Giuliani administration, as well as the use of emergency hotels as a four-year, you know, decade-long practice that started off and on during Lindsay. 
And so our, pro our plan is to really have families remain in their communities of origin, where they will be closer to anchors of life, be it school or uh, you know religious support and family, because we know that is better for families. And this is not something that's happening. It's a five-year plan, so we have a plan to do that. We've already made some progress on, in this plan. We've closed over 1,000 cluster units, almost 30%. Um, we have cited, we have open shelters that have been able to have children remain or return to schools of their community where they originated, and so we're driving towards that. Um, I think it's been a haphazard, you know, multi-year um, system where this has been several years and it's not, it's not going to happen overnight, but that's what we're driving towards in the turn of the tide plan. people's times, but I guess now I just have to push a, I, I really appreciate all of that, and I think we are not paying attention to the segregating and poverty concentrating consequences of the actions that we are taking. And I appreciate that on an individual family by family basis, that seems right, but we haven't taken a step back and said, what's the consequence of, of doubling down on segregation and poverty concentration? And I'm, I'm just asking that we find some, and, and, and you know, I appreciate that it's an exhausting job to serve the families that we have, and it's necessary, and you're doing a lot of work to do it, but in as much as we're also having a conversation about shelter siting and also having a conversation about school integration, we need to find some ways to take a step back and see what the consequences of those things together are. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Um, so I have a few questions, and I'll, I'll turn over to my colleagues. Unfortunately, I have to run across the street to take a vote, uh, as do a number of the members of the committees, but I'll be back, obviously. Um, uh, so first thing I wanted to ask about, um, according to the MMR, uh, as, as you referenced in the testimony, the percentage of children, uh, families that are placed according to their uh, their youngest children's uh, school, so within that borough of the of the youngest children's school. I just want to make this clear what the data is from FY13 through FY17. FY13, 70.5%. FY14, 65.4%. FY15, 52.9%. FY16, 51.8%. FY17, 50.4%. This is with the objective of reaching 85%. I read that and I see an ever deteriorating situation. And the fact of the matter is, and I appreciate the testimony, and I appreciate the capacity concerns within the system. I know there are capacity concerns within the system. I know that any given day, we're probably at 99% of our capacity within the family shelter system. But the fact of the matter is that in FY13 and FY14, we were also at capacity within the system. The system expands and contracts with the need. And so, you know, we didn't have an extra 10% capacity within the system back in 2013 and 2014, but we were able to meet not our objective, which is 85%, but we were able to be much closer. Now, I appreciate also that that deterioration has slowed down um, over the last two years, but um, I guess my question is, have we really done an examination beyond just capacity? And capacity is obviously a major component of this, but do, uh, have we examined what other factors contributed to that deterioration? Uh, is there, I mean, you know, obviously it's a very complicated system. It's a very complicated system. And you can't just be moving, you can, I mean, we'll get to the issue of, of moving people around and uprooting um, people's lives, and that's another question, but, but in terms of the original placement, and this has to do with, with how we're getting families um, into their initial placement beyond the, beyond the conditional placement, um, 
have we done an examination of why that happened? So let me take a step back. When families um, are being placed in a conditional setting, um, and we know you talked about it, and I think you hit the nail right in the head, capacity drives this. Um, so at any given moment, in every given time, and my last position was at PATH, so I'm very in, you know, intimately aware of what happens in trying to find um, placement for the families as they're in the building. And so it really is, the bottom line is capacity. We do work with DOE, and, and we talked about the busing and making sure that families can get to school. It, and we also offer educational transfers, right? So there's that opportunity for families to be transferred closer. Um, but capacity is what it is. And so for us, you know, and I walk in that building, there's so many families that are waiting to be placed, and the availability of units are not there. So that is where it is. But why, you know, back in, in FY13, FY14, we were able to 20% difference from today, there was still a, there was a capacity problem back then. It's, the numbers of homeless families increased, has increased so dramatically for us, right? So families are coming in. We, when families get to us, everything else has failed. We're the safety net of the safety net. So by the time they get to us, everything has failed. Families having in, coming into shelter has increased. It's now 70% of who the face of homeless is. It really is for us and for all of us is an affordability crisis. So families cannot afford 34% are working, can't afford you know to make ends meet and to pay rent. So they're coming to shelter. I appreciate so all of that. But all that's, capacity but, for us. I mean, I've I've been on this committee since 2010. That increase, that dramatic increase, started in 11 when you saw when uh, advantage, advantage ended, right. Right. and and so there's. I I'm just. It, obviously, it, it, there was a there was a three year period where we saw a precipitous decline. Precipitous decline. Um, one year it was at seventy. The next year it was at uh, uh, the next year it was at sixty five. Next year it was at fifty two. I mean that's a, and then and then it, and then it stabilized. But there was a, I mean it stabilized at the at the low at the low at, level at the low level. level. And so, yeah. you know, it, I'm wondering. There's, I'm wondering have you have you engaged with uh, system analysts? Um, uh, folks that are able to harness technology, that are able to um, figure out just broader system issues about how placement allocations are happening. I mean, obviously there's a capacity problem, um, but, you know, that is so dramatically off base. It, and and, it, and I, I mean, I appreciate that the mayor has a, a long-term plan. Every month that goes by, where 50% of the children entering shelter are not placed in their home borough and are therefore forced onto all types of traumatic life situations, every month that goes by, is, there's an injustice done. And so I appreciate a long term, we gotta, you know, it's great to like expand capacity and good, okay, but, but uh, are there any other I mean, are, have we have we engaged outside analytic firms? I, I mean, normally I'm not like all you know. Elizabeth knows like we're we're not normally uh, asking for consultants to be hired, but I mean <laughs> for something like this where we're trying to 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 um, uh, address a, a, a serious problem. Is there any? I mean, have we gotten outside advice? Any anybody that's outside of the DHS world to say? How can we take another look at this? And from a different angle. We could we could talk about other options offline, but for us and looking at availability of spaces as families are in that building, it is capacity the way we're seeing it. We can talk offline about other options for us to look at it, help us to frame that, because I think that as families come into us, it is our responsibility to provide places that are really looking at appropriate placement for families. Um, our 90-day review talked about how we should really think about making placements. And during that time, recommendations were made, and so we're implementing alternative tight plan now. So that's a long-term view. I appreciate. Is your there question a short-term strategy to get that number increased? At this point, it's capacity, and I think we can talk offline about. That's a long-term strategy. There's got to also be a short-term strategy. I mean, I will say yeah. this, and you can agree or disagree, but 50 percent unacceptable, just unacceptable. And I'm going to agree any, with any, you. Yeah. And I, I, you know, it's an affordability crisis in New York City. I absolutely agree with you. It's, I mean, I'm not being argumentative, but it is an mm -hmm. affordability crisis families by the time they get to us. I mean, I will say this. I just got done working with, or I'm just wrapping up working with a family that's in the shelter system. One year. They've been in shelter for a year. A year it took to get to get out of the shelters. And that's, that's ahead of the curve. And that's with my active intervention. Active, active intervention. Um, and so 
that's also part of the question is how do we get, I mean, on the back end, how are we getting families through the system? There are a lot of problems within the system that contributed to that being a year. That could have been six months, in my opinion. And, and I respect that. I think there's also the reality of available housing stock, um, right? Yeah, so but I, I could have, I, 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 you know, I was very intimately involved in this case, and that year could have been six months. Um, have, have, have you all read the IBO report from last fall? Has everybody read that IBO report? Fall. Yes. Uh, it is uh, 50, 58 pages. Or I encourage you all to, if you've read it already, re it's 50, 50 pages. I encourage you all, if you haven't read it, to read it. If you have read it, I encourage you to reread it. Um, one thing that it does, and this is, you know, IBO uh, um, has rigorous standards of, um, of how they analyze and uh, accumulate and analyze their data. Um, they interviewed people. They did 100 interviews with, with, with teachers and with principals and with families in shelter. And they identified a lot of issues based on interviews with people. Do you guys do interviews with people? We actually collaborated and the author is sitting in the room. Okay. So we were very involved in this process and supportive of this, of this research. So there was a lot of recommendations out of that. Um, there's a significant issue around, I mean, so we, we can go through them, but I mean, have you, have you, have you bullet pointed all of the issues identified in that report and said, okay, this is our strategy for, for addressing this issue that was identified? I mean, there's probably 25, 30 um, real issues that are, are not just, you know, issues that are unaddressable. They're not just, they're not insurmountable issues. They're issues around operation. Mm -hmm. Have you, have you, I mean, and this requires, a, obviously requires a collaboration between DHS and DOE. Have you, have you set up a, a, a you know, a, you could set up a small task force between the agencies to say, okay, this is how we're going to address the 25 issues identified in the IBO report. Well, we have staff from both DHS and DOE who meet together and talk together daily um, and have regular meetings together to work on what are the areas where we can better collaborate, how do we make our data match more process, more, more, a smoother process. I'm seeing some head nodding in the room. Mm -hmm. um, so we are working hard at get to collaborating together to try to address issues as they come up. Okay, so like for example, shelter policies and environment can present obstacles to schooling. Is that something that, that is, is there a strategy for for uh, how sh certain shelter policies, whether it's room inspections in the morning, things like that, are there directives? For I mean, one thing that they identified was that oftentimes uh, parents are required to be home for their room inspection. Um, you know, there's a, a, a quote that I uh, says that you know they gotta they've got to uh, uh, get breakfast ready. They have to um, uh, do everything that's required in the morning. Um, wiping bums, you know, everything that's required of a parent in the morning and, uh, and, and there's, you know, they have to sit around and wait for uh, a room inspection to happen. So, that we've so council, council member, I, I am not familiar with the report and I would have to read it and spend some time talking with my colleagues about it, so I'm not prepared to talk about it today. Okay. Um, you have to get every, you have to leave everything neat and tidy, but the amount of time that they give us to get up to get children ready for school, to make breakfast, to wipe bums, and to leave the place clean is not enough, said Parent 4 and Focus Group 6 in Manhattan. Um, I mean, there's an issue of, that was identified of uh, parents uh, uh, having to be home when they're supposed to be taking their children to school. Uh, so, in, in general, I think we should take a step back and I could look, give you a little bit of shelter, you know, the way we how shelters should operate. I'm not so sure about this report and what was said, but one of the things is that for us, families' needs need to be assessed individually. You know, families need to get their children to school. Families need to get to work. 
we're providing those opportunities. We're not saying, you know, so I would have to read that report and see what's being reported there and then figure out, but mm -hmm. our plan, again, I'm returning back to what we're doing is looking at families as individuals. We don't want to check boxes. We want to make sure that we're assessing the needs of every family that comes to us and that we meet those needs in a way that's dignified for those families and their needs are met, right? So part of the work that we are doing is driving towards that. So it's not, you know, I'm checking a box, but you said in your opening, these are humans, and right? So when I walked into PATH on that first day, I imagined coming to PATH with my son um, mm -hmm. and how that would be for me and for him. And so part of the work I did at PATH was to really make changes in making sure that we identified where fam that these are families and that the workers get their needs met so that there could be a mutual understanding between both of them. So sitting in this role for the last three months, that's part of what I'm going to drive towards. So that, you know, re results like this that you're referencing that I haven't read, we can work towards making sure we mitigate those and course correct. Um, so, you know, just something as simple as opening a, a child weight space at PATH when I was there because we wanted children to have opportunities to be children. So making sure that needs are met for families as they come through the doors, whether it's an intake or a shelter, is what I want to drive towards. And so I would love to, I'm going to read that report and then talk with our colleagues about what it entails, but I'm not prepared to kind of answer specifics around that today at this time. Um, I mean, a lot of my questions have to do with recommendations out of the report or, or uh, issues identified out of the report. Um, with MetroCard, mm -hmm. uh, we heard that uh, part of the one of the issues is that um, metro cards are issued on a on a weekly basis. So they're weekly metro cards. They're not monthly metro cards. Is that right? So parent metro cards are weekly metro cards. Uh -huh. Students receive a semester long metro card at their school. But a parent, if they want that metro card, and if obviously if they're living uh, on public assistance or um, uh, or or don't have a or don't have a cash case, um, uh, and are and are you know that is an important part of of their monthly budgeting. Um, why weekly and not monthly metro cards? Because also they have to go to a DOE borough office in order to get that metro card. Is that not? That's right? not correct. The family assistant at the shelter can provide the parent that weekly metro card. Okay, so they don't have to then go because I think that was one thing that was identified correct. to us is that they were required to go down to the to not DOE. Correct. Borough office. What if there's not a family assistant at the DOE shelter? I mean, at the uh, DHS shelter. So, even if there is not a family assistant full time at the shelter, they do have sh a specific family assistant is assigned for each of the shelters, and they make the rounds to ensure that they see their families. Because those are those are DOE employees that are assigned to networks that are not necessarily. So there's there there. This is the family assistant that's going around to, to various right. Shelters. So they'll be going to shelters that are, for the most part, in the same location, the same general area. So if there are multiple shelters in the area. You might have a family assistant working what about, across several. What about areas. hotels? Families in hotels. We also have family assistants who are assigned to cover those commercial hotels. What about cluster sites? Same thing. Okay, we so do. every so every no family has to go down to a borough office in order to get that weekly metro card. Um, so, ah, so sometimes DV? Okay, so sometimes DV shelter sites do, and we will look into that and see what we can okay. do to fix that. Right, that shouldn't happen, obviously, with all the other issues that uh, families in a DV shelter are dealing with. Uh, I agree. One with thing you. that makes it, you know, no sense. Completely agree. Um, back to the issue of conditional placements. I just want to be, just to make mm -hmm. it clear on the record, you know, how long does it take to, to establish a, a a bus uh, protocol for a family. Right. So it can take between seven and ten days. Okay. Now, if there is already a bus route, let's remember there are, we currently have 500 different bus stops at shelters mm -hmm. that are currently going to, actually it's, it's well over a thousand schools. So if it happens that a student is assigned to a shelter where we already have a bus route that's going close by to that student's school, it will take shorter. We still do need, depending on the type of bus, we may still need to contact all of the different people or stops along the way to let them know that there's a change to the route and that their pickup time may change. And that's part of our part I, of our process. I concur. I think it takes organizational genius to make bus 
the bus system work in New York City, and this is a very complicated issue. But one thing I want to point out is that conditional placements are not 10 days. They're 30 or 40 days. Even though they're only supposed to be 10 days, in reality, they're actually much longer. And so, I mean, that's, that's, that's the reality on the ground. Um, and so, you know, while they're only supposed to be seven to 10 days, they're actually much longer. Um, so I don't, you know, that's obviously, it's, it's a complicated operational yep. um, uh, endeavor, but it's not it, that those two times are not, are not co, you know, so coincidental. So council member, the process to apply for shelter, on average, this determination is made within 10, the 30 to 40 days that you talk about are outliers. Um, so the process that we have in place average is 10 days in my experience <laughs> I got it um, how what is the process for being for having a transfer for educational hardship so for example a family is placed they're not in their home borough they're one of the they have the one in two chance of not being placed in their home borough what is how how many parents try to get a transfer to their home borough and and what is the process for them to do that and is it is it a, is it a um, streamlined process families um, in shelter make a, a, a request to be transferred to the shelter staff and that's put into a, the CARES, the DHS CARES system of record. Our staff um, on our end at DHS headquarters at 33 Beaver approves a transfer um, and then they go into a queue. So again, I know I talked about capacity and so they're, they're put in priority because we have such few, few slots. But when there's an immediate emergency need, families are transferred based on what their needs are. So educational is one of them. Um, medical is one of them, so it really depends on what the need is of that family. Um, it, the, the request is streamlined from shelter staff into the care system of record. The staff makes the approval and it goes to a unit that searches for the placement. Uh, we have made um, some strides this past year in making sure that we're tracking that so that we have opportunity to see who's up next in a, in, in a, in a way that's less, less haphazard so that we have systems to know who needs to be transferred, and so that's something that we're working on, or worked on to make improvements to. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that it, the report shows is that there are 25% um, of children in shelter are at two or more schools during the course of the school year, and that's, um, you know, that's a, a very high number. Um, What what accounts for that, and what is what are what is DOE and DHS doing to to really address multiple transfers over the course of a year? Well, what's likely the primary driver there are families who are choosing to change from their school of origin to a different school or school closer to their shelter. You know, but then, in a, but that, then there's an additional transfer, that's two transfers. So what I don't know or what, what we don't know from the data you're providing is whether they then changed shelter location or moved from um, a con conditional to permanent or conditional to a shelter and then from shelter to permanent. And each of those transitions for the family may um, result in their choosing to transfer their child. So there are incidents where um, a child will be in a school just during conditional placement. So for that 10 days to 30 days or 40 days, they're, they're in a separate school because, it's possible. because they're there for a conditional placement? It's possible. We, you know, that, again, is a family's choice whether they choose to continue to the school of origin. Obviously, we have made... Um, the choice to provide yellow bus service for the youngest children in order to help support families who choose to remain in the school of origin. I mean, that, that is the goal of 
of the transportation is both to improve attendance, to reduce absenteeism, but also to support a family remaining in that school of origin. Um, I just have one other question I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Barron. Um, with this issue of absenteeism, mm -hmm. the IBO report also identifies that uh, children in shelter across, the, across grade levels have an average of a 10% lower attendance rate, uh, or a, 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 a attendance rate, or a higher absentee rate than, um, uh, than, than uh, uh, housed, permanently housed uh, children. Um, is that alarming? Well, of course, high chronic absenteeism is alarming and is something that we're deeply concerned about. Um, one of the things that we did last year was we hired some attendance teachers specifically to focus on students in shelter um, and to work direct, more directly with um, large shelters where we saw uh, many students in absentee issues. And what is the leading driver of that, of absenteeism then? What, what have you heard back and reported back from, uh, from those attendance teachers? It's various. It really runs the gamut. Um, uh, so if you can get a little closer to the microphone. Sorry. The reasons for absenteeism really vary. Um, mm -hmm. We're talking about families in trauma, and that also is going to affect their daily routines and being able um, to get students to school. Um, but we did learn some lessons on those attendance teachers that were shelter-based last year. Now we're taking a lead in turnkeying the information and lessons learned to other attendance teachers, so it's gone. So we've some, we've expanded capacity. Example of a lesson learned. What is what is some of the what are some of the lessons that that uh, we saw from that first year? Um, I'd like to invite Kathy Polite, who is our Executive Director for Students in Temporary Housing, to come up and, and address this. Great. Morning. Morning. Uh, Still morning. No, it's actually afternoon. Yeah, is it afternoon already? 12.02. <laughs> That's what happens when you're having a good time, right? Uh, Nine passes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we were able to, um, through the $10.2 million, um, invest in attendance teachers, and they um, actually went to, uh, they worked in several uh, shelters. Um, logistically, with the uh, staff and shelter, that's Department of Ed, as well as Department of Homeless Services. And, stu and um, what we found is that the attendance teachers tracked the students. That is, as students began to move, I'm in a shelter in Brooklyn, I moved to the Bronx, they also continued to work with the family. And so because we know that um, children and families are experiencing a high degree of trauma in, in shelter, having that continuity was a big help. So our, our lesson learned, one, one of the major lessons was the continuity so that our um, Attendance teachers make contact now with, um, I move out of shelter A in, in Brooklyn, um, moving into to the Bronx. The attendance teacher that's overseen or, or has responsibility for the shelter in Brooklyn makes contact with the attendance teacher and other school personnel. Virginia Gap also um, having the social workers there has, has been an integral part. So the attendance teachers worked extremely close with the Virginia Gap social workers as well, actually going into the shelters um, meeting families, conducting workshops, helping families to um, overcome the barriers that prevent them from attending school. Once, of course, um, the immediate uh, challenge at hand um, is, is dealt with. And so I would also add a daily feed that was developed, right? So rather than having monthly information about attendance, we have it daily. And so we were able, in collaboration with the family assistance workers and the attendance teachers, the shelter caseworkers are also monitoring and ensuring that children leave for school or parents report that they leave to school. And so then we get the daily feed that says, yes, Jocelyn Carter attended school this day. So that has been able, has helped us um, to really track uh, what's happening in real time rather than in a month's time. Okay, so then do you believe then that through these efforts we will see that number, that, that gap closed? 
or continue to close? I mean, is that something that, that is, that is a, a achievable objective So with the tools that we have today? We are beginning to see small uh, improvements. We are seeing an improvement, a small improvement in uh, the chronic absenteeism rate for students in shelter where we are s slowly uh, but steadily closing the gap against uh, the citywide chronic absenteeism rate. Um, we are seeing um, closing the gap in the high school graduation rate for students who have been in shelter. So we, we do believe there is an enormous amount of work still to be done. We do believe that this is an, a, still a, an acute set of issues of students who need support, but we are s beginning to see small signs that the efforts that we've been putting in over the past couple of years are beginning to have an impact. Councilmember Barron. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the chairs and to the panel that's here. I just have a few questions. The McKinney-Vento Act requires, or the Department of Education requires that a poster be in every school. Mm -hmm. I don't see them. If there are schools where you are not seeing that poster, please let us know. Secondly, the McKinney-Vento uh, Act provides for $100 for each homeless student. I believe that's a minimum of $100. So it requires a set aside from our Title I funding to a school uh, of $100 specifically to address issues um, related to the homelessness, to, to provide additional services for these students. They are still receiving, uh, and, and clearly a student who is homeless, a student who is in a shelter, uh, is also a Title I eligible child. They are receiving t full title, the school is receiving full Title I funding to provide uh, all of the other range of Title I services. A portion of that is required to be set aside. So is this an additional $100? That's my addresses. question. No, it's part of their Title I allocation. So it's not additional. They would have gotten this some money anyway, but now out of the money that they're getting, they have to pull $100 for the student who is in temporary housing. For a school that is that is, is that accurate? For a school that is as a school, a Title I yes. school, it that is accurate. For a school that is not a Title I eligible school that has students who are homeless, they do receive so an incremental. So this school now is being doubly penalized. You're entitled to it as I don't know if someone can fix this mic. I got a lot of feedback here. You're entitled to this designated amount as a Title I school, but now since you have a population of homeless students, you've got to pull from that Title I allocation and have a set aside for your, dedicate, for your designated students in temporary shelter. What additional money does the city put into uh, allocations for schools that have students who are living in temporary shelters? So I understand you have the broad programs mm -hmm. and the social workers and uh, other personnel. What additional money do you give the school? And you know I'm asking the question because I was a principal. Yes. And I know what the burdens are of trying to identify how to give support, additional support to students who are in temporary shelters. And, so what and that's the, why we're mm -hmm. doing programs like the Bridging the Gap program we, where we are providing a social worker to help support Good. school support. I, I'm rushing because I have to get over to the yes. other side as well. What academic support, what additional monies can be identified in a school budget that says, okay, here is um, additional money for direct services in an academic capacity, because we know that it's the students who are in these temporary shelters that are not proficient in these tests that the DOE loves to use as a measure of academic success. So what additional <coughs> academic direct services can we point to in the budget that assist these students that are so needy and so traumatized? So the school receives the same academic uh, fair student funding for a student who is low income for all of its students who are Do low you think that's sufficient, that they get the same and they don't get additional because they have additional the population that has drastic needs? also receives additional funding for students who are below proficiency, so they are also receiving funding for these students because they are below proficiency. Is that the same as any other school or is it in addition 
It's the same as any other student That's a problem. who is we're not, below proficiency. Right. We're, we're not addressing the additional needs of schools that have students who are living in temporary shelters to give them additional. They're getting the same as what everyone else is getting. And of course, we appreciate the social work and the family liaison. But they're not, in my opinion, getting the direct academic support that they need to help lift these students to be able to address these uh, high stakes tests that the DOE administers. Um, and I have another question. In terms of identifying these students that are perhaps doubling up, what mechanism do you use to identify students? Do, is it that the family themselves has to report that to you? How do you know? I believe that we don't really have the full picture of students that are living doubled up and even tripled up. So we do receive that information through families. It is self-reported in the housing questionnaire when they enroll in a school. And schools also become aware over the course of the year through conversations with the family or with the children where that information, if something has changed since the beginning of the year, that information may come up. And finally, um, in terms of students being entitled to after-school programs, what provisions are made for students who need transportation via busing to be able to participate in after-school programs, yet at the same time get the accommodations to be taken back to where they're living? We try to provide um, the after-school programs in schools where they're strategically located near the shelter or near the schools, so that we actually provide programming directly in the schools or in the uh, DHS facilities. We also have uh, borough wire programs, and um, we have been able to, for example, in Queens, the Borough Field Support Center has um, committed buses, um, provided a grant in order to um, transport our students from our shelters because they're not on, they're not being transported normally to, on a Saturday. So, for the services that are given um, at the facilities, what are what are the um, What's the classification of those who are delivering? Are they teachers? Are yes. they certified teachers? We have certified teachers. Um, we also have uh, guidance counselors uh, and or social workers. Uh, we partner with community-based organizations um, to facilitate the, ac the activities. And council member, I'm gonna add that in shelter, we partner, DHS partners with DYCD to bring the Compass after school program to shelter. So we have that opportunity for shelters, for some shelters to have that on site for families to participate in. Um, I wanna thank you, but I think that the problem that we're seeing of, student, of the increase in homelessness and uh, the increase in so many other of our systems is a reflection of the racism that's embedded in all of these government agencies that exist it's seen in housing. We have the same population of students who are coming from families that in many instances are unemployed or underemployed. And until we get to those root causes and until we address it and eradicate it, we're going to continue to see a swelling of these kinds of problems. And what we're doing is um, only temporary and it's not really correcting the situation so that we can move beyond this. Until we address the issue of creating housing for people who are low income, very low income, and extremely low income in, in numbers that address the situation that we're facing, we're going to continue to have this problem. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Barron. Let me now go to some follow-up questions that I had. I hope I've announced everybody who's here. Chin. Councilmember Chin and uh, Councilmember Gibson have joined us. Councilmember Gibson has questions also, but let me just go to a follow-up on uh, something that uh, Councilmember Levin had had started, which was that um, when the when the um, when DHS opens a new shelter, how is DOE informed? I know that this has been a problem even for elected officials, because I had the Pan Am come to my district and was not informed until the students were on the way, and I'm hearing complaints now from uh, elected officials in Long Island City of the same situation occurring. So how is DOE informed and how are the schools, the local schools informed as well? The DHS informs DOE directly um, of new shelters. How far out? As soon as we know. So it could be the same day, it could be an hour before, or it could be during? So emergency hotels that we're using now, yes, it could be the same day. Um, 
shelters that we have cited and have opened, um, the family with children facilities that we are actually the building, um, opening those notices are out earlier, but emergency for those really covering the folks who are in the path intake at the time, they're finding out that day too. Okay, I mean, I'm not gonna get into the whole argument right now about what constitutes an emergency, but this continues to remain a problem uh, with elected officials. Uh, so I imagine it's probably a problem with DOE as well. Uh, how much funding does uh, New York City receive from the federal government for implementation of McKinney Vento and for services for homeless students? So I believe the McKinney Vento grant is about $2.2 .2 million. Are there other sources of funding uh, for implementation of McKinney Vento? So there is. There's also an AIDP grant, um, and that provides $8.7 million in funding. And have there been any changes in federal funding uh, that impact the services DOE provides for homeless students? The McKinney-Vento is a, a grant that we get through the state, so the state gets it from the federal government, and over time that, that has increased somewhat. Do we expect any changes uh, because of the uh, administration in Washington now? Um, no, we don't have a concrete sense of what, what will happen with that. Mm -hmm. um, according to the uh, school allocation memorandum uh, number eight, fiscal 18, there are 76,910 STH students in the city. This is an increase uh, since 2017, uh, in which um, there were 71,992 students. This means the number increased by 4,918, or approximately 7% in one school year. Given the increase uh, in the number of homeless students this school year, have you been able to maintain the same service levels of previous years? That's an additional 7% um, for 4,900 students. Yes, we believe, in fact, that we have augmented services in the past year, even with the increase. The work that's being done through the community schools, the, the health and mental health work that's being done, the bridging the gap, the money that we received from the city has really helped us tremendously in expanding the programs and supports we're able to offer. Let me go to District 75 schools. Councilmember Barron was talking about Title I schools before. Uh, District 75 schools do not, if, uh, under, the way I understand it right now, receive any additional Title I fundings. Um, does the DOE have any uh, plans to change that or to deal with that or to support um, uh, District 75 schools? Well, District 75 schools are funded to meet the needs of each individual child and their classifications within District 75. Um, so I, I believe we view the District 75 funding as sufficient to meet their students' needs. Even though there are these additional um, issues that many of these students will be dealing with? So many of these issues uh, that a student is addressing um, will be part of and incorporated into their IEP. So if a student needs additional counseling, for example, and so those needs would be funded. Mm -hmm. What about like emergency supplies, issues like that for students? Uh, it, it's a very fair question. Um, you know, we, I would expect that District 75 schools uh, are able to do many of the same things that we see individual schools doing, that uh, students who need supplies are provided supplies, students who uh, may need a, you know, clean uniform shirt. Um, we have many of our schools that have uh, set up capabilities for families to do laundry to address their base students' basic needs. Um, we also have partnerships with Volunteers of America that provide uh, several thousand uh, school supply filled backpacks to students. Our field support centers have created wonderful programs for students in shelter, students in need, to come and get school supplies, uh, book fairs, and other opportunities for these students to receive the materials that they need to be successful. This is my second hearing on homeless students in New York City Department of Education in about a year and a half, I believe. And I have to tell you, probably one of the most shocking things that I heard 
was from a principal at the previous hearing mm -hmm. who told me that she has a washer and dryer in her office to, to meet the needs of these students. That's how desperate these students are and, and, and how some, some principals are coming up with some solutions. Um, but um, I just think that drives it home so clearly to me what, what these students' needs are. Um, in preparing for this uh, hearing, uh, I was a little bit surprised to hear that only 35 children have been identified uh, as students in temporary housing in, in preschool f who have preschool IEPs in New York City. So how come, why is that number so low, only 35 students? Um, I, I would I I'm not familiar with that particular statistic. I'd love to, to meet with you offline to understand where that is. Um, well, we had the whole we had a whole push in terms of registration and finding preschool placement for students in shelter, um, both uh, the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds. Um, and so we, we know that students, we know which students were coming from shelter that went into the, the pre-K programs. Are those pre-K pre, uh, pre programs generally contracted out with um, community-based organizations or private uh, pre-K programs? So pre-K for all, I believe, is about 60% are DOE-operated um, schools or facilities, and about 40% are um, community-based organizations, or what we call NYSEECs, uh, New York City Early Education Centers. How, how do and you? I'm not, I, I know it's 60-40, I may have flipped the order. We'll How do you identify those preschoolers uh, for being homeless? Well, so through our data match, we are able to identify um, children who are preschool age uh, who are in the shelters. And our Office of Student Enrollment has worked very closely with the shelter organizations and has done a great amount of training in the shelters to increase parent awareness of the opportunities for their students, to increase parent applications to the pre-K programs. Um, and as I said earlier, uh, we made an, a pre-K seat offer to every single student in shelter, every four-year-old, uh, even if the family did not apply. We also work with the shelters to identify early learn opportunities for their younger children um, because we agree and believe that that early education is incredibly important. And at shelters, we're doing lots of work to really educate parents about the importance of using um, pre-K um, um, because I think traditionally parents really don't understand that, so we're doing lots of education around that um, so they could help, they help to increase the uh, registration for those services. Okay, let me go now to uh, questions from Council Member Gibson followed by Council Member Chin. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Drum and Chair Levin. Um, good afternoon, it's good to see all of you today. Um, I have just a few questions. Um, obviously there's been a lot talked about today but um, I do remember when we made the announcement on supporting $10 million of critical resources and programs for students in temporary housing. So I represent Bronx County, um, specifically District 9, um, well, well known and familiar to the Chancellor. She's visited District 9 many, many times and will continue to do so. Um, District 9 has a high concentration of students in temporary housing. So I applaud the efforts of the Department of Ed and DHS as well as many other agencies to really figure out how we can address this issue. Um, I've always said, and I, I will continue to say it, that a student's housing status should not determine their academic future. And the fact that so many children, particularly children of color and children that have disabilities, are living in temporary housing, that shouldn't mean that they are destined to fail in our schools. And so we really have a great responsibility. And this council obviously wants to support all of the endeavors. Um, so I have not had an update, and I uh, definitely want to talk offline about specifically District 9 and how this initiative is working in D9. But I wanted to ask specifically about the, the bus routes, the social workers, the, the literacy coaches, to really focus on students that are truant and you know, reducing the absenteeism. All of the workers that, you, that we're talking about that were hired by DOE, are they physically in these shelters or are they traveling like every day talking to clients? How does that work? Well, first of all, I, I want to recognize and acknowledge that yes, Community School District 9 
does have the highest number of students living in shelter, and it does have the num highest number of s students in shelter who are attending the local district schools. Mm -hmm. So you are absolutely right that District 9 is a very high concentration of students in shelter um, who need support. Um, the social workers that are hired as part of Bridging the Gap, they are at schools. So they are in the school okay. uh, where students are attending. Um, the uh, family assistant workers, uh, they are in shelters, and but they may go from one shelter to another, either on a daily basis within the day or over the course of a week, depending on their caseload and the needs of the families that they're serving. Okay. And the after school reading uh, program, ARC, right, uh, is shelter based. And those are DOE teachers who are going and providing literacy work in the shelters. Okay. And Council Member Gibson, as part, of, as part of New York City Thrive, DHS hired and continue to hire uh, social workers who do work in shelters. We have over 180, and we continue to hire to meet the needs of the families to make sure that they, all their needs that they have are assessed um, while they're in shelter also. Okay. I've also been a part of a few efforts, and I, I do recall one of my schools in District 9, um, one of my principals at this school, we did a couple of days of awareness where we had uh, postcards and brochures of information just sharing about the services that we were giving out early morning. Mm -hmm. And then I also know, and she did tell me, so I can affirm that that is true, that she did have a full-time social worker at her school because she has a lot of students that are from the local shelters. So, you know, the reason why, you know, I, I focus on this is because District 9 is so high, um, and that's for a reason, right? All of these issues and societal problems we talk about, there's an underlying and root cause of why our children are living in these conditions in the first place. And so we want to make sure that as we have these conversations and we're implementing all of these measures, they're actually showing success and they're working. Um, every case is different, and I've learned that in my own work in the office. Um, I, I also wanted to ask specifically, because I've had a, several cases come to my office with students that are facing high absenteeism. What is the time frame that the department identifies a student that is absent too long? Like, how long do we wait before uh, uh, something is triggered to say that there's something wrong in this student's life and we have to do more? What's the time frame? Right. Yeah, actually, we just revised our regulation that has to do with attendance. It's, it's A210. Um, and at the same time, we revised the regulation that has to do with child abuse and neglect prevention, which is A750. These were revised a few weeks ago, approved by PEP, um, and they address attendance policies. But every school is required to make outreach on the very first day that a child is absent. That's in A210, um, and we have strengthened um, the requirements and I think made more clear clarified uh, the obligations of school in terms of informing parents when their students aren't in school and trying to ascertain why the students are, are missing school. And in the case of our, our students in temporary housing, um, we have an extra obligation to remove barriers. That's part of McKinney-Vento, so it, it all ties in. We don't, however, have a magical cutoff number that at which point that we say this absolutely is educational neglect um, it has more to do with what we're hearing from the parent um, or not hearing from the parent uh, that would trigger a call um, to the state central register if we think that educa educational neglect is transpiring. Okay. And, uh, Chair, if you'll indulge me, I just have one final question uh, on interagency collaboration. Because many of our students face a multitude of challenges in their home and their community, um, in addition to DHS and HRA and DOE and ACS, um, I also have students that come from violent homes um, where the mayor's office um, to combat DV and the Family Justice Center is involved. 
Um, immigration obviously is a big issue. So whose responsibility is it to ensure that there is an actual collaboration? So we are having the same conversation and we're not running families through bureaucratic red tape where they have to satisfy DOE's requirements, then ACS, then DHS. I mean, it's a multitude of things and families get very frustrated. So how are we making it easier for them in terms of interagency collaboration on families that are in shelters that have a multitude of challenges. Whose responsibility is that? I think it's all of us. I think within the past year, we have really made strides to collaborate with our partners in DOE and ACS. Um, and so we do have memorandums of understanding so that we're sharing data so that if a family's ACS involved, that we are aware from self-report and from clearances, but also being able to talk about what ne what the family needs are, and so that we're not saying that you have to be here when the family has other appointments, so that we're doing streamlining together. Um, I think it's important for us to really recognize that by the time the families come to us, you know, so many things has failed, and our work is to be able to mm -hmm. bridge that gap exactly. and to make sure that you know we're looking at individual approaches for every family, and so we're doing that. Every person here, right? So our partners at DOE, our partners through HRA. Our partners at ACS, we are working together. We have weekly meetings. You know, we're trying to mitigate and really look at what's happening and to rectify and course correct when necessary. Okay, there are times when you know and everything doesn't go right. That we work to make sure that we course correct so that information sharing happens. And I think when we work in isolation, that's what causes families to be pulled in different directions. So we have really worked to eliminate eliminate that, and we have several standing committees that work together. Okay, thank you, thank you, chairs. Thank you, uh, Council Member uh, Margaret Chen. Thank you, Chairs. Um, as the Chair mentioned, uh, we had an, um, another hearing previously about the homeless students. And I was surprised to find out that some of my schools um, in District 2 and District 1 had a large number of homeless uh, students. So I want to make sure if we can get updates um, on the school and to make sure that they are getting the extra support, you know, the social worker or the family assistant um, to make sure that these students are taken care of. Um, I had a family shelter that was closed down, so I don't know if that had um, any effect on the numbers of homeless students in our, um, in our schools. I mean, most likely they want to be back in the neighborhood that where they have families and, and friends, so they still uh, travel back. So if uh, I can get updates online in terms of some of the students um, the homeless students in my district. The other question I have also is also related to the interagency, because a lot of the homeless family that I, my office come in contact with, oftentimes are family who got burned out of their homes or were vacated. So, and they end up in the shelter. A lot of them, you know, they don't want to be in the shelter because of the language issues or they just don't know how to navigate the system. They rather just double up and and wait for the, the landlord to, to fix the apartment. And that's how something that I wanted to ask is say, are there any coordination with HPD to really try to expedite uh, some of these repair issues so that the family can move back home? And oftentimes it takes a long time. It takes more than a year uh, for a family to be able to move back. Um, so are, in terms of your interagency's coordination, have you worked with HPDs? Um, DHS work with HPD on a variety of topics. Um, for us, it's really about housing. Um, when the families arrive at in our family shelters, it is a different system than the emergency shelters that HPD runs. And so we, on our end, are working with HPD in terms of trying to help us to find affordable housing for families to exit. So I can't really speak to the HPD system, um, emergency system that they have. So you you're telling me that HPD has their own The, the families that are burnt out yeah. are not managed by DHS. But there's, so there's no, no coordination at all? At a time, if they come to us, right, so I'm not doing any work up front, upstream with mm -hmm. HPD. We're not. We're working on the families that come through the DHS door to look at, can, is this the right place for them? Can we prevent them from coming into shelter? Can we mediate whatever the issues are? Can we provide supports to the family so they don't have to enter shelter? Um, can we provide rental assistance at the front door so they don't enter shelter? Those are the families that we're serving in DHS. If they're not able to um, be diverted and they enter the DHS system, our work is to help to exit families into, into permanent housing. We also go upstream um, uh, with families who 
through a home base, HRA home base program with legal services um, to prevent uh, the families from being evicted. So we do that work up front, and if they come to our doors, we're trying to mediate with the Department of Homeless Services, um, the HPD shelter system I can't speak to. Does DOE uh, take care of these families or children? So we certainly take care of the children. Um, again, uh, we are not in, we don't have a data feed with HPD, um, but we do support the children, whether they continue at their school of origin or whether they transfer to a, a school near wherever they may be staying. We absolutely support the children. So once they register to the school or they go back to the school, I guess if the school finds out that the student is now uh, living in a shelter, they Correct. will report it directly to DOE. Correct. Now, but Councilman Chin, too, this was a question that I had raised earlier in the in the hearing uh, that is of major concern to me is that I see a lack of coordination with the HPD and the DYCD shelters, and that's something that I would like to look at a little bit further with the Department of Education as well. So thank you for reiterating circumstances and and incidents that you've seen in your district as well. Yeah, because oftentimes a lot of the family, I think, uh, you know, because they understand that living in shelter is going to be so difficult, if they can find a place, you know, with friends or family, they would do that. And oftentimes they don't get the support. So I think that we need to, HRA, to really look at how do we help this family, even though they're doubling up, at least they have a roof over their head. And it is a way to provide some assistance in terms of rental assistance um, that they can legally utilize to be able to stay. I think that will make a big difference for these students and family who are doubling up and tripling up. And I, I'll tell you about our home-based programs through HRA. So home-based provides services for families who are doubled up. Um, and so if a family does call 311 and they can really assess the family's need, they can also get rental assistance without having to come into shelter for some of those families. So that's also an opportunity for families um, who are doubled up. We, we're going to follow on that. Absolutely. Chair, can I just ask one last question? It comes to coordination. It's, what I find so difficult is that, you know, when constituents that end up in the shelter system, whether they're families or they're senior, and they're lucky enough to get a voucher, a link voucher or whatever voucher they got, can't find housing. It comes back to my office every day, you know, especially the seniors. Like, I got a voucher, and they're very happy that they got a voucher, and the voucher is like $1,280. Can't find an apartment. Can't find anything for them. So I think that if HRA, with the interagency, there's got to be a way of helping people find apartments. Maybe working together with real estate companies and realtor and kind of make a concerted effort because, yeah, family gets the voucher, but then six months later, they still can't find a place to live. And I'll, I'll tell you that, um, yes, we do have housing specialists and we do work with brokers. What we do have now is a, a, a part of HRA is a source of income discrimination um, unit, right? Because we do know that there are landlords who do not want to rent um, to those who have uh, any subsidies. And so we do have that. If people are finding that, landlords are saying no subsidy, they don't want to rent to them, the source of income in unit can help, right? Because just having a lawyer call, some of those landlords do make a difference, and families and individuals are able to exit shelter. And so we can talk offline about that too. That, that's great. I didn't know that that helps. But I think that we need to have a concerted effort to really work with some good people, good-hearted people who might be in real estate to really help identify, you know, home. Maybe some of them could be sharing an apartment. I mean, young people do that. They pay high rent, they share, they have roommates, um, family mates. I don't know. I mean, there's got to be a concerted effort to really help people. Now that we have resource to help them pay the rent, we got to help them find a place to live. Agreed. Yeah. Talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Chin. Um, so I have a, a few more questions. Um, first question. So we uh, passed a bill uh, earlier this year that required uh, ACS to impanel a foster care task force. And uh, it's a discrete task force. In other words, it has a certain number of meetings. And at the end of it, it's tasked with producing a report. Um, I've attended. I've 
sponsored the bill that created it, and I've attended it uh, in its in its uh, uh, in its meetings thus far. It's been very successful. Uh, there's been representatives from the Department of Education. Ursulina Ramirez has been there. DHS, obviously, Commissioner Banks, and, and uh, uh, I believe you've been there. Have you been Molly there? Murphy, and well, as well as the man you roll. Yes. yes, I've been there. Um, and uh, and it's, it's been really good. It's been really good. Uh, collaborative, and uh, one of the things I've been most impressed by is that uh, ACS has kind of let the issues determine the agenda. And we've broken out into, into subgroups, and it's been and each group is producing recommendations. Um, would, would you guys be open to doing a similar type task force on the issue of students in temporary housing? We are <laughs> always open to dialogue on how we can better serve students. Okay, but a structure like that where it's, you know, a discrete number of meetings, it's somewhat intensive, it, they hired a facilitator to kind of manage the whole thing and you know and it's producing recommendations that that um, you know might might end up being uh, a challenge to implement but are you know that's part of the conversation is is how you know the implementability of it but there are issues that are brought up that weren't even on the radar mm -hmm. uh, before so so absolutely we'll take it on a consideration and we'll okay yeah. I'd like to work with you guys on that okay. I don't want to have to do a bill about it I hear you. Okay. Um, uh, there's a couple more questions. With, with regard to um, uh, DOE staff at PATH, um, one thing that we've seen is that not every family coming in uh, has actually sees that staff. And I know that there's only, I think, two staff members now, three staff members, but the third one hasn't actually started or, anyway. It, what percentage of, of families are actually seeing that DOE staff as they come in with, with, sc with school-aged children? Do we, know the, do we know the data on that? I actually do not know the data, but what we did do at PATH is rearrange where the DOE staff sits. Um, prior to uh, last year, when I, when I got there, I got there a couple of years ago, they were on the fifth floor, and you, you know, you've been to PATH, you know the process, right? So families come down, mm -hmm. and so now we have the DOE staff on the lower level where families are waiting. So the opportunity for every family that comes through the door who has come through the, the interviews and have met with all of the, the stakeholders there, the DOE then sees them at the back end when they're waiting. So it's not where, you know, they're, they're, they're going through having to give their two-year housing history and really feeling emergency. So we move that, and I think that strategically helps and helps us to be able to ensure that families have much more opportunity to meet with DOE. And so because we have the family's waiting there, and they're now sitting downstairs, it's a bigger uh, opportunity for that to happen. So we did make that change. Um, in, in your testimony, you said about regarding the uh, bill to create an edu educational continuity unit at PATH, that PATH might not be the right uh, location for that. Um, the, the, one of the reasons why we put that in the legislation was that that's what we were hearing um, from uh, uh, from from clients um, through uh, uh, advocacy organizations that had done focus groups, um, have you you know talked to families about where they feel like such a unit might make the most sense? Um, you know, my my concern obviously is that by the time they get through a conditional placement and into um, you know a long term longer term placement within the DHS system. Um, it's, they're already kind of behind the curve, and so that's the reason why doing it at PATH is so that you're able to kind of try to uh, get into a kind of preventative mindset as opposed to, uh, um, you know, a corrective mindset. I think for me, and, and thinking about families, they're in an emergency situation that they are at PATH, mm -hmm. and my staff are asking lots of questions, and the process is long and it's exhausting. We do hand out education materials, transportation information to families, but their focus is really getting through this intake process on this day to get to placement. Um, children are tired, parents are tired, it's an overwhelming feeling. I know that personally, and mm -hmm. so the first day that I walked into PATH, and I had been at DHS for a long time, and in 2014 I had to cover PATH before I was assigned there, and I walked in there the first day, 
And for me, seeing the families come in with all of their belongings and their children, it was, you know, a sla- you know really hit me mm. that these are really humans. Mm. And, you know, I spent a lot of time on the first floor and the lower level just, just being around families and just listening to them. I think it's an overwhelming time for them to start really thinking about that and really putting effort into that. I think it's hard. I, 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 I understand, right, we do want to make sure that there's continuity and we want to make sure that families don't get left, the children don't get left behind. But I, you know, being there and working in that building, mm-hmm. um, especially when it's a long day, it, it is a long day, um, it's hard. And I, I don't know if we're going to be able to have parents concentrate. We do give some opportunities uh, for children to be in a wait space away from parents and just be able to have parents when they're doing their family work or interview or when they're meeting with the domestic violence social workers. But their minds are so much on trying to get through and really recall, well, where did I live two years, right? So there's there's lots of information that we're asking mm-hmm. um, on that first day. I think it'll be an overwhelming decision, if, you know, for families to have to do that. If I was sitting at PATH on that day, I'm not so sure I'd listen to you, right? My 10-year-old son may not, I mean, I may, you know, because I'm going to tell you truthfully, after a while with my son, I'm like, okay, I've had enough, right? But mm-hmm. they don't have that opportunity unless we give them a little three-hour break, but it's hard for families to concentrate right. on Perhaps that time. Don't want to so I think back. that yeah. at shelter level, Right? And I'm not saying it, it's after conditional at all either. I think that we have made an effort to really push shelters to work with families as they enter the door, not wait for determination. But conditional, so, you know, you're in a hotel somewhere out by the airport. It, it's it, not a and, and, you know, council member, I'm going to talk about right, our future, right? But at shelter, wherever it is, right, it's, it is still less stressful because they have some place we're going to put my head tonight. Right, um, and so but it, at the do, beginning, but they don't know where they're going to be. Right, but logistically, how does that work? I mean, the thing about PATH, it's a single location. So if you were, I mean, if you were in a conditional placement in a hotel out by JFK, who's, who, ha, you know, you can't have, obviously, I'm, three, I have three DOE staff Absolutely people, not, but the uh, DHS providers. You know, providers. running around to every hotel room. Um, in, 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 in Eastern Queens. The provider staff is who we would lean on to do this work. Yeah, but that's, see, and I, that I appreciate is really that. It's making sure that we focus on giving families information when they're at their location. I mean, that's. But I will say that. this, and I think you know this, right? So we rely on our provider staff uh, because, the, you know, just to everyone, so everyone's clear, I mean, the, the, the D, family DHS system is about 90% uh, not for profit run. Um, so, you know, this is not DHS staff that's doing most of the provision of services. It is not. So we have only two family shelters. Yep. Completely true. My work is to develop providers. My work is to standardize expectations and training. My work is to move us away from the one-size-fits-all. So my work is to make sure that the information that we're sharing with these families is mm-hmm. information that they need and that we're doing individualized assessments and not just really staying on you know, doing that. So I think we're going to drive to it. I, I hear you, part Rupo, of the but I, I, do. I was going to get to like that. There's, you know, when you're in a, when you're in a conditional. So when in condi- the conditional placements are are also run by not-for-profit providers. The conditional placement turns into the regular shelter, so there's no moving um, from conditional. It's just a well, flipping out system. A, yeah, but if um, you're in a, if you're placed conditionally in a in a hotel. You might not stay in that hotel. I mean, those are. If you those may not stay in that hotel placement. if capacity allows me to move you. Right, but but you, but you just said before that ten ten days is the average time spent in a in a in a transitional placement, right? No, in the process of us determining whether family is found eligible for shelter. If even if Nobody's wherever you're in placed, transitional. Placement no, we stop. Too. We, you're, if if there's vacancy, yes. So we stopped, we stopped the system where there was a conditional placement, and once you found eligible, you're moved to a, a, a permanent shelter. We stopped that system. It's wherever you're placed, if you're found eligible, you're remaining, right? If you're in a hotel and a capacity need, capacity comes up, and I can transfer to a Tier 2, we will, but you're not being moved after 10 days. You're not being moved after 10 days. That was stopped several years back. Um, I mean, so again, it, it really I was is working with a constituent... A year ago, who was moved out of a hotel after 30 days into a DHS-run family shelter? So. Because the capacity allowed it. Okay, but she was moved. So you're saying that that's an anomaly that most if of the time people are not moved. I think what I'm saying to you is capacity drives where families are placed, and so if you're placed. But a conditional a placement is so. How many? What percentage of families? What percentage of families are moved after their conditional placement? 
we don't have a data study. I don't have a data study on that. I will have to get back to you on that. Okay, because that we're not, we're not transferring after conditional placements. Except the time when I was working with a constituent a year ago where it, it did happen. I will look into that. Okay. Um, I mean, it goes to then, okay, so then you think that the, the right the right intervention point, because so the bill calls for uh, an establishment of an educational continuity unit at PATH that would be staffed by Department of Education staff or DHS staff. You're saying that, that it's preferable to have educational continuity interventions at con during the conditional placement? I'm saying that at PATH we already have DOE staff and, and DHS staff on site. But what percentage but of, D, of, of, of people walking in the door, families walking in the door, are meeting with that D, DOE staff? I don't know the data point, but I know because we moved the family, the fam, the assistance, family assistance down to lower level, that I would, I would want to tell you that most of the families are saying that, but uh, DOE might be able to have much more data on that. And I'd also add that when family assistance do intake, at the individual shelters. That is another opportunity for them to talk to families and work with families and discuss their educational options. And that family right. assistant is always available to discuss those options because family choices may change after they have been living in shelter but for some period of time. But that family assistant is not, I mean, how many family assistants are there in, this, in the system? 117. There are 117, 117 for 23,000 children. They, they're not all coming in. Those 23,000 children are not all coming in at the same time. And so these family assistants meet with new families in shelter um, and have an opportunity then to reinforce the educational options that a family has and that any other time that they are interacting with that family, they may also have those conversations. Okay, but what you're describing is the status quo. So and the status quo is unacceptable. Let me just tell you one last thing. Um, at PATH, Right now, families that enter the door get, do get an education guide that when they're settled, right, so that first day they probably are not reading it. When they get to their placement, they get some opportunities to read and really then have questions because when I'm coming into PATH, I don't know where I'm going to be placed, right? And so that's the worry. I think that being able to get opportunity to kind of say, all right, this is where I am, and then think through, you, you know, what the next steps are would make, you know, for me to think through it. That's the route that I would want to urge you to think about. Um, and then lastly, I, I, I'd like you to talk a little bit about how you, as a, how we as a system are looking at, um, in an um, evidence-based way, addressing the long-term trauma that children endure uh, by being in temporary housing for extended periods of time because we know that the impacts carry uh, far beyond even the time that they're eventually hopefully stably housed that s that trauma, that impact affects their academic ability, it, 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 uh, it affects uh, the, the rate of absenteeism. Um, you know, these are, these are, these, those uh, traumas stay with those children. So what are we looking at as a system in terms of trauma-informed care, evidence-based models? Where else, where else are we looking? Are we looking at other systems throughout the country um, uh, that have adopted uh, programs? What's on the cutting edge right now? What are you learning by going to conferences in you know, San Diego or uh, you know, Phoenix or wherever around the country that you go to go to these conferences? Where, what are you learning? What are you learning about, about uh, trauma-informed care for children in temporary housing? Can I go to the conference? Well, I, I'm going to really ask that Kathy come back. Kathy is a social worker by background, and she has attended these conferences and knows an awful lot about tra trauma-informed care. There you go, though. <laughs> yeah. I would like. Sorry, I'm moving over to um, Yeah, so we partner, well, actually within the Department of Education, um, community schools, and uh, New York State Teach, and the OSA Office of Safety, Youth, and Development. Um, we work with uh, Dr. Ham, um, who we actually became aware of through New York State Teach, who's actually excellent, uh, known throughout the country, um, and is uh, trauma-informed. 
um, practice and um, his work in providing professional development. So what we did last year with our Bridging the Gap social workers, in addition to our social work interns um, and partnering with community schools, is we trained our uh, 32, at that time, 32 um, social workers in the Bridging the Gap schools um, to in a more intense um, training in uh, trauma-informed care, who then are turnkey, they've begun to turnkey the information to school personnel. So we're building capacity in that way. In addition, the school-based liaisons were trained by New York State Teach um, last year, so school year 2016, 17, and um, 15, 16 in trauma-informed care through um, Dr. Ham as, as well. Yes, and teach, teachers has on thank you has an ongoing webinar which is which is online that um, our educators can go to. And this type of professional development is made available to every teacher, every school personnel, and the entire system. Well, through the webinar, yes, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and do you know how it's being utilized? Do you have feedback from UFP or other other institutional partners on or or, or feedback from individual? school personnel to, to hear what, uh, principals, for example. What do you hear from principals? Okay, so. Yeah. Well, I want to say that the teachers' webinars um, are, serve the purpose for social workers of getting continuing ed units, CEUs, and so they're very popular among social workers because there's that additional benefit that it goes towards their certification and their ongoing certification needs. Um, so the feedback from the actual participants who are social workers is very positive. And so, Council Member, I'm going to add uh, two things. Right. So, in addition to the Thrive Social Workers, um, who certainly use trauma-informed care but other models of practice, because we don't want to move away from one size fits all, we have a clinical services unit at DHS, and so we are looking to build um, structure and standards around what models of practice we're using, and that's the unit that we're developing. But the third thing I want to point to is really going upstream to parents. Right. So, we want to make sure that we're supporting parents to really look at disrupting the intergenerational aspects of poverty, right? So we want to look at providing educational services to parents um, so that they too can get jobs and they can understand, you know, kind of how do you move out of poverty and to be, to help your, you, you, the, the families develop and grow. So we're looking at our CSU unit at, based at DHS that provides services through the, through the Thrive and so they're working together for, to help families as well as the children, but also looking at how do we make referrals for families, for adults, so that they can get the educational needs met, um, and so we're doing that work also. I think for us, it's a, you know, it's really looking at big picture. Um, it's not just trauma-informed, but, you know, I'm also a social worker and have several years of kind of training and looking at what do we need to do to break and disrupt kind of poverty and the, and the lines of poverty. I'd like to also talk about a couple of other programs um, because we are looking for ways and identifying ways to partner our students who have experienced homelessness with students who have been formerly homeless who can then help them see uh, the path to a better future for themselves. Um, so I know we have some mentorship programs for our 11th and 12th graders who are temporarily homeless um, and uh, actually this year we had a first of our its kind event. Um, we identified a group of students in shelter who are going away to college. Mm. And so the needs that they have in how do you think about you know moving away from their families and going to a college dormitory and their specific needs. Uh, we had a college, we called it the college pop-up shop. Uh, where DOE employees voluntarily contributed and bought items that would be useful for these students in their new lives in dorm rooms. We had a celebration for them. We had formerly homeless students coming who are now in college come back to speak to them um, because we do recognize that ultimately the goal is how do we help them see that better future and, and be successful and continue on that path for themselves. And I'm going to add one last thing I promise. It's for the past three years, we've had a graduation event for our students who are seniors who are graduating, who've been accepted to college. Um, at um, our educational person is here, and so they get a, a laptop, and we really help to throughout the year really help them to really guide 
their process so that they can graduate and actually get to college. And this, this was our third year this past year. I'd also like to give a shout out to Council Member Van Bramer from City Council on working with Girl Scout Troops. Girl Scout Troops. Absolutely. A uh, very positive um, yeah. uh, program, and hopefully that will be able to uh, continue to thrive. Um, last question for me. At our last hearing, we had testimony from a principal from PS 156, uh, which is that in Councilmember Barron's district? Yes, that is. Uh, Beverly Logan uh, was the principal. She testified, very moving testimony, um, and she's a principal in Brooklyn. And um, she talked about um, the steps that she takes as a principal mm -hmm. um, to providing care for uh, her students that are in temporary housing. And it was, not only was it very moving, it was very illuminating. Um, and it spoke to a lot of the practical day-to-day -day, um, uh, impacts that her students are feeling and, and what teachers and, and what administrators in that school are, are doing to, to, to try to mm -hmm. um, address that. So um, have, you, have, you con have you talked to her since that time? I mean, she was, she, it was uh, a really, really remarkable mm -hmm. testimony. That was uh, over a year and a half ago. So the initiatives that we've been discussing and that we funded now for the past two years um, f came out of a series of interviews that we did with principals following that hearing. So following that hearing in February of 2016, uh, myself, Lois, um, a woman named Emmy Liss, who is uh, now Chief of Staff to Deputy Chancellor Wallach, um, the three of us uh, actually went out and visited and interviewed a number of principals who had high numbers of students in temporary housing and students in shelter. And so from those conversations, there was a generation of a number of different ideas around initiatives that we could pursue, mm -hmm. and we came to agreement and funding for the ones that we, in fact, implemented. So it comes very much out of conversations with principals. Councilmember, do you have another question? Thank you. Uh, yes, just to ask, I guess, a follow-up question. At the time, just prior to that hearing, the principal did share with me that based on the high numbers of students that she had who were living in uh, temporary housing, she partnered with a group in the, in the community and they had laundry service where they provided washing machines mm -hmm. for the students to be able to have their clothes washed. And the battle that she had with DOE to pay for the electrical cost or the hookup or whatever. So I hope that that's been resolved. I haven't spoken to her, but it was a b real battle. And I think it was very telling that um, she had to have that kind of struggle without the DOE saying, wait a minute, this is something urgent and necessary. Let's find a way to make it happen. So I don't know if it's been institutionalized or if she's been a pilot for that. But those are the kinds of things that, you know, when I talk about principals and the challenges that they face when they have a, any number of children who are living in temporary housing, that those are the kinds of things that they know about and encounter mm -hmm. that, you know, don't get major attention. Earlier uh, this So do you know whether or not they morning. got the electricity or that? I, I don't know, but oh, we will okay. follow up. Yes, Kathy. they did. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Um, but earlier in, in today's uh, questions, one of the things we talked about is we have really focused uh, the initiatives of the past couple of years around how do we support principals right. and schools that have high populations of students in shelter. You know, the, prior to this, the focus was on how do we support the students from the shelter perspective, and, and that's what the family assistant workers uh, do, and that's what um, all of the content experts do. But we've really tried to bring these initiatives to support the principals and the schools that have the higher concentrations. And that has been a very new um, perspective and focus that really came about following the last hearing. And it's sad because uh, I, I know a principal who, in fact, retired uh, many years ago. It was about 10 years ago. She retired because of the pressure that she felt from the district superintendent to get these scores up, even though I think, I don't know what percentage of her students were in temporary shelters, but she wasn't getting any kind of additional support. And she said, I can't get my scores up if I can't get my children in school and 
get them in their uniforms if we're a uniform school. So it, it really has had a, a really um, hard consequence on a lot of families, the children, the school, and the, our society at large. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's going to end this portion of the hearing, and we're going to now call up uh, our next group of uh, witnesses. Um, so, uh, first I'd like to call up Liza Pappas from uh, the New York City Independent Budget Office, who's the author of the report. Um, Liza is still here. Well, I usually swear in all my witnesses. I'm going to ask you to raise your right hand. Do you um, swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and to answer council member questions honestly? Yes, I do. And your name, please, for the record? My name is Liza Pappas from the Independent Budget Office. And Ms. Pappas, would you like to start? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So good afternoon, council members Drum and Levin and <laughs> other members who are here in spirit. <laughs> My name is Liza Pappas. I'm an education policy analyst at the New York City Independent Budget Office, where I've conducted the agency's research on students in temporary housing with a particular focus on students in the shelter system. So thank you for the opportunity to testify today. In our report, Not Reaching the Door, we looked at in depth at the multi-layered challenges temporarily housed students encountered in getting to school in years 2012-13 and 2013-14. The number of students has grown since we issued our report. According to Department of Education Statistics, last school year, 105,133 students spent at least some part of the year in temporary housing, a 5% increase over the prior year. For students and their families living in the shelter system, just getting to school often proved daunting. They face long commutes and other transportation difficulties, competing demands on their time from other city agencies, along with the transitory nature and stress of life in a shelter. 
As a result, students who were identified as spending at least part of the school year in a, in a shelter had average daily school attendant rates well below those students in permanent housing or those doubled up in the homes of family, friends, or other persons. While the average attendance rates for students living in shelters increased a bit in 2015-16, the most recent school year for which we have data, their attendance rate remains well below that of students in permanent housing or doubled up housing. In 2015-16, the overall attendance rate for students in shelters was just over 82%, compared with over 90% for their peers. Students in the shelter system had lower attendance rates at every grade level, and I've attached a table showing um, average attendance rates by grade and housing type for school years 2013-14 through 2015-16. Students residing in the shelter system also had substantially higher rates of chronic absenteeism, which the Department of Education defines as students who are absent 10% or more of the school year, the equivalent of missing 18 or more days. While the rate of chronic absenteeism among students in shelters edged down in 2015-16, students were cro chronically absent from school, those students in shelters, more than twice the rate for, than they are permanently housed in doubled up peers. And the rates of chronic absenteeism were highest in the early grades and also in the high school grades. I've also attached a table showing those rates by grade and housing type for the same years. An IBO report released this past April observed that students in shelters tend to be concentrated in a relatively small number of schools across the city. In 2011-12, there were 61 schools that served a population where more than 10% of students were in shelters. In school year 15-16, there were 155 schools, roughly 11% of 1,475 traditional public schools opened that year. In our research, school staff overwhelmingly stress that budget resources have been far short of what is necessary to provide comprehensive and coordinated counseling, attendance outreach, and family engagement services. Since then, the city has begun to provide some resources specifically targeted to students residing in the city shelter system. In January 2016, the city announced that all students in shelters enrolled in grades K to 6 would be guaranteed busing to any school they attend if the distance from the shelter to the school is more than a half mile and if parents so desire. The estimated annual cost at that time was $24 million. For the second year in a row, the city allocated $10.3 million in educational support. This year, funds that had supported 10 attendance teachers were shifted to expand the Bridging the Gap program, a social worker program, to a total of 43 schools. In addition to school-based social workers, the fiscal year 2018 funds support after-school programs, special admission application processes, and technology, Blackberries, to better connect Department of Education family assistance with schools, shelters, and families. So I thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I'd be glad to answer any questions you may have. And in my observation in terms of your testimony, um, and um, I think you were here for the last hearing as well, if I'm not mistaken, uh, is that it seems that the uh, numbers have more than doubled where there are 10% or more students uh, in schools that are homeless. And um, the funding, although we are grateful to have gotten it in, I guess it would be fiscal six, uh, fiscal 17 and fiscal now 18 as well, is not baselined. And last year in our budget negotiations, it was actually taken out. And then we had a fight to get the 10.3 million put back in. So uh, I have deep concerns about the continuation of that funding to meet what to me appears to be a growing need uh, for our students in the public school system. So these numbers are very helpful to us uh, in terms of when we move forward in terms of our budget uh, negotiations with the administration. And I don't even think that 10.3 million is enough, nor do I think it's hitting every school where we see pockets of uh, homelessness increasing. And I asked some questions about schools in my own district, but basically I'm hearing those stories in other places as well today. So. I do want to thank you for coming in. I don't know, if Chair, you have other questions, yeah? Uh, thank, you. thank you, Chair Drum. Um, so thank you very much um, 
for your testimony and uh, and for this this exhaustive report. So I, I just want to ask you a question just quickly about the methodology. So you did something you say in the intro that's somewhat unconventional for an IBO report, which is to go out and talk to um, talk to families and 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 uh, school personnel as well. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that decision and kind of how that that um, that, that factored into the way the report was constructed? Sure. I'm primarily trained as a qualitative researcher, mm -hmm. and uh, we thought that with um, this issue and with many issues that we see in the school system that adding mixed methods research would really enhance our understanding of the kinds of challenges students were facing, in this particular case, students in the shelter system. So while we knew that students, we could see that students were absent more or chronically absent more, we didn't know why. So mm -hmm. the numbers are always helpful, but they don't g always get to the why and, and the hows, and so we added a qualitative dimension to, to help us with that. Um, do you, it, after spending, I mean, I, how long did you spend put, working on this report? In the report in total? Yeah. Three years. Three years, right. So three years working on this report, do you see this as an intractable problem, or do you see this as a problem where there are solutions that can move the needle? I don't know that I can assess whether it's intractable or <laughs> there are solutions, but I, I know there are a lot of people working on it, a lot of people care about it, and it, I, you know, it behooves us all to work together on it. Um, do you think do you think it would be uh, helpful to have you know a kind of uh, a, a formalized structure within between interagencies when I mean, you talk about interagency coordination? Um, uh, do you think having that type of structure so that we can kind of all identify the issues, get on the same page, and work towards um, uh, solutions might be you know a good idea? Yeah, the I mean, look, we. We heard across the board, you know, this is, New York City is a very large, diffuse system, you know, with a lot of different people in different pockets working on this issue from different angles, but not necessarily in communication with each other. Mm -hmm. And so certainly, you know, more collaboration and communica ongoing communication so that the agencies that are essentially serving the same families with children can better serve them, it seems to be something we heard a lot about. Yeah. Um, Councilor Brown, do you have any questions, at Councilor Rogers? Um, so I, I want to thank you. I mean, this is—I I, I feel like your report is a blueprint mm -hmm. for how we should be moving forward. And you know, the three of us here in four years, we're we're out. We're no longer council members. And uh, um, uh, the mayor in four years, he's going to move on to something else. And so it's our—you know—we have a very short time limit. Uh, to try to make an impact, and so I would, you know, I would like to you know, continue working with you. Obviously, you've, you've done the, you've done the the legwork here to make this uh, a, a successful blueprint. So I, I would like to try to move forward from here. But we have a kind of a sense of urgency that we want to do this on. So I would like to work with you. Good, thank you. We're always happy to work with you. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Okay, and then we just have one panel. Um, um, Beth Hoffmeister from Legal Aid Society with Coalition from the Homeless, Giselle Ruthier, Grant Cowles from Citizens Committee for Children, and Randy Levine from Advocates for Children of New York. Hi, everyone. Uh, whoever wants to begin. I can start. I can start. Um, my name is Giselle Ruthier. I'm a, a policy director at uh, Coalition for the Homeless. We've submitted joint testimony with Legal Aid, as usual, um, and it's a little bit more lengthy, so I'll just summarize here. Um, 
we know the number of children that have spent at least one night in DHS shelter actually has leveled off over the past three years, but the number of school-aged children has increased over 2015. So likewise, as we've seen with the DOE data, the number of homeless students in New York City as measured by the State Education Department has reached its highest level yet, driven by both an increase in the shelter system and a significant increase in doubled up students. I want to focus my testimony specifically on one of the more difficult times for homeless children and families in shelter, and that is the application process at PATH. Uh, disturbingly, the eligibility rate for families applying for shelter has reached a new low under Mayor de Blasio um, this past July. Just 38% of families with children who applied for shelter were found eligible, and that's down from 61% in November 2014. Additionally, 43% of those families had to submit more than one application before ultimately being found eligible. Um, the application process is often the most traumatic and daunting period for families, um, as Administrator Carter actually talked about in her testimony. Um, it's generally filled with stress and uncertainty, and it's not uncommon for children to miss a significant amount of school during the application process. Um, so I want to acknowledge that Administrator Carter it, acknowledge the difficulty and the stress at PATH, but we want to also talk about the fact that it's possible to change the bureaucratic processes at PATH and to make it less of a stressful process. Um, so we've continually uh, recommended that the city implement a much less onerous shelter intake process in which applicants are assist assisted in obtaining necessary documents and recommended housing alternatives are actually verified as available and pose no risks to the health and safety of applicants. Um, if we actually made things much more, uh, um, much less stressful at PATH, then maybe there may be better ways to actually implement, implement solutions uh, that would support school age uh, students that are coming in as well. Um, we've also recommended that the shelter intake process uh, be revised so that homeless children are completely excused from appearing at PATH so they do not have to miss school in order to be present when the family applies for shelter. And we have several other recommendations detailed in our testimony about uh, making sure families are placed near children's schools, um, additional DOE staff at PATH, and expanding after-school programs. Uh, but I want to highlight again, uh, highlight something that's extremely important here, and that the best solution to helping homeless students in temporary housing maintain engagement in their school is to actually move them into permanent housing as quickly as possible. And so we therefore urge the city to immediately increase the number of permanent affordable housing for homeless families, including doubling the number of NYCHA apartments and allocating a much significant, much greater number of the Housing New York plan units to homeless families. And this will ultimately reduce the need uh, to fund all of these supports for students in shelter. It will reduce the need to open new shelters um, and improve well-being overall. Thank you. Hi, I'm Beth Hoffmeister from the Legal Aid Society's Homeless Rights Project. So Giselle obviously just did a brilliant job of summarizing um, all the different ways that the city can help. And I just want to highlight on behalf of my colleague, Catherine Cliff, who wasn't able to testify today because she's actually at PATH doing outreach and helping families uh, with, their no, with their legal rights while they're applying. Um, we get calls on our hotline every single day and talk to families every single time we're at PATH who are you know, hours away from the schools. And the children are also going to different schools. And I think, you know, Council Member Levin, you really touched on the, this idea of the kind of the day-to-day -day practicality of what some of these um, decisions that are being made on a high level, how they're actually impacting the families on a day-to-day -day basis and how problematic that is. And, and touching on something you were, you were kind of talking back and forth about with the administrator um, about the 10-day placement is, is a good example because each application, you might have a 10-day conditional placement, and then you might have to go back and have a whole new reapplication. So well, I understand what the administrator was kind of trying to describe is that, oh, it's this 10-day placement. But the reality is, as we all know, we see families that have to reapply 12 times before they're actually found eligible for shelter. And if in those 12 times of 10-day placements, you don't have busing for your kids, that's a big deal. I mean, that's a very, if you want, need to work, if you have to go to any other appointment, um, just, I mean, it would be a big deal for me just ex existing to have to spend my time taking my kids two and a half hours, you know, every single day to and from school. So I think that um, in terms of what you're trying to do with the hearings and with the bills to get on the right path of really pushing, um, you know, the different agencies to work together to support these families, it's those practical day-to-day -day considerations, the things like the washing machines in school, you know, the drop-in centers that have access to those things also. All of that's very, very important, and um, the testimony goes into more detail kind of about um, generally how that can be done, but uh, we just also want to say that we 
really seen the impact of how these policies affect families on a day-to-day -day basis with very basic things is a, is a big deal um, in terms of how they're functioning or, or not functioning as well as they could be. Thank you for your leadership in holding today's hearing and for the opportunity to speak with you about support for students in temporary housing. My name is Randy Levine and I'm Policy Director at Advocates for Children of New York. For more than 45 years, Advocates for Children has worked to ensure a high quality education for New York students who face barriers to academic success, focusing on students from low income backgrounds. We're proud to house the New York State Technical and Education Assistance Center for Homeless Students, TEACHES, which works on several thousand cases each year regarding the educational needs of students in temporary housing in New York. Yesterday, we released new state data showing that during the 2016-2017 school year, 104,088 students in New York City district schools were identified as homeless, a 5% increase from the previous year. In other words, one out of every 10 students in New York City schools was homeless. You just heard from the IVO a lot of the research about the poor educational outcomes for students living in shelter. We have data and statistics in our written testimony as well on that topic. Over the past few years, the city has taken some positive steps to help students living in shelters. We have additional information on that in our written testimony as well. But as you heard today, and just to highlight, yellow bus service for students living in shelters has made a big difference. The efforts to increase pre-K enrollment among children living in shelter, the $10.3 million to support students living in shelter, including funding for 43 Bridging the Gap social workers in schools, the after-school literacy programs in shelters and enrollment events at shelters, and the community schools pilot focused on students in temporary housing that you heard about today. We're very pleased that Chancellor Farina identified addressing the needs of students who are homeless as one of her priorities for this school year. As such, the city should ensure that there's high level leadership on this issue and an infusion of resources to address barriers to school success for students who are homeless. Importantly, the city needs to work across agencies and across divisions of the DOE to develop coordinated and coherent plans to assist students who are homeless in a number of ways, including combating chronic absenteeism, connecting students with academic intervention services and mental health services, ensuring that students with disabilities are evaluated and receive the services to which they are entitled, and strengthening access to a variety of DOE programs and post-secondary options. We will be making additional recommendations to the DOE in the coming weeks to this end. In the meantime, here are some important steps that the city should take. First, the city should strengthen and expand the Bridging the Gap program, placing social workers at schools with high populations of students living in shelters. The city took an important step by funding 43 social workers to work with students living in shelters at elementary schools with high populations of these students. However, the city has not baselined the funding for these social workers, putting the future of the program in jeopardy. Furthermore, more than 150 schools serve a population in which 10% or more of the students are students living in shelter, and most of those schools do not yet have a bridging the gap social worker. In addition to placing social workers in schools with high concentrations of students living in shelters, it's important to have trained, qualified professionals on the ground at the city shelters who can address the educational needs of students. Many children will attend schools that don't have a bridging the gap social worker, and social workers based at shelters can work more closely with parents. As you heard, there are around 117 DOE family assistants who work in shelters who are primarily responsible for conducting intakes with families, giving basic information and metro cards, but the family assistants are not required to have a college degree or any formal training in social worker education. They're not a substitute for trained social workers who could provide the social emotional support and advocacy that this population needs. Given the challenges faced by students living in shelters, the DOE should hire shelter-based social workers to provide intensive case management focused on children's education, and we have some more information in our written testimony about that. The city should also ensure that families receive information about their educational options when they apply for shelter at PATH. 
When families enter shelter, they need information about their options to keep their child in their original school or transfer their children to a new school and transportation. Furthermore, state law requires local social service districts to assist parents in choosing a school within two business days of shelter entry. We have more information here about the importance of that, but to this end, we thank Council Member Levin for his leadership in sponsoring intro 1714, and we have some recommendations to make that bill even stronger, because what we wanna see is education become an integral part of PATH, and to ensure that a conversation with every family about education happens there. We heard the testimony today. We don't think it's an either or. Should we discuss education at PATH, or should we discuss education with families once they're placed in shelters? These conversations may need to happen multiple times, but as Council Member Levin pointed out today, PATH is a single point of entry where we know every family goes to apply for shelter, and we think it's important for parents to have a conversation about education there and leave with information about their school choices and transportation. We have several recommendations in our written testimony for improving transportation. Of course, this builds on the success of the city's initiative to offer yellow bus service for the first time to all kindergarten through sixth grade students living in shelters. We'd like to see that strengthened, including by providing transportation to students in conditional shelter placements for the reasons that you've heard today. We think there should be a spearheaded coordinated attendance effort as well as increased access to early childhood education and have also included more information about that in our written testimony. And of course, think that the city should make every effort to place children in shelters in their community school district of origin so that they can stay in their schools without long commutes and to the extent that isn't possible to have a transparent process for families to request shelter transfers if education is, is a barrier. And finally, we support the data reporting bills and have attached recommendations for strengthening these data reporting bills to make sure that we get the most useful information. We thank you for holding a hearing on this important topic. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. <clears throat> Good afternoon. My name is Grant Coles. I'm the Senior Policy Associate for Youth Justice at Citizens Committee for Children. And I'm delivering testimony today on behalf of Stephanie Gendel, our Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy, who's out of town at a conference, not San Diego, Baltimore. Um, <laughs> uh, first, we'd like to thank Chairs Levin and Drum and members of the General Welfare and Education Committee for holding today's extremely important hearing and for your commitment to improving educational outcomes for homeless students. The impact of homelessness can be devastating to a child's education because it often causes disruptions that impact their attendance and academic performance at a time when the child is already struggling with the trauma and life changes associated with living in a homeless shelter. For many children in shelter, however, school and early education programs could, be, could provide a structural consistency in their lives. Unfortunately, students in New York City um, homeless shelters have the highest rates of absenteeism. Uh, we, and we also wanna highlight and echo the, the data you, um, you mentioned, uh, Chair Levin, about the, uh, the borough placements. Um, as well as the IBO uh, report and um, how integral and alarming those data in that reporting was. Um, the magnitude of the family homelessness crisis and the devastating impact it can have on children is what led CCC to partner with Enterprise and New Destiny to co-convene a family homelessness task force. Together with about 40 other organizations, we brainstormed recommendations to promote and enhance the well-being of homeless families and those at risk of becoming homeless. Our report and recommendations Focused on a number of those that uh, focus on a number of key issues, including education for homeless students. In short, we are urging the city to reorient the shelter system and the education system to be more proactive about helping homeless families with school-aged children. For the most part, these children are New York City public school children, and the school system must redouble its efforts to ensure these children are both getting to school and then having their needs met so that they are able to learn. I'm going to highlight um, just seven brief recommendations, some of which are echoed um, or have been mentioned already. Uh, first, uh, making the educational success of homeless students a city priority. The city needs to make an intentional effort to increase attendance, decrease the time for transportation to be arranged, and ensure homeless children are supported with whatever additional services they might need, including IEP services, tutoring, and or mental health services, and strong leadership and commitment to this issue will make a tremendous difference. Uh, second, past intro 1714 um, 
as mentioned today, talking to parents about education starting at intake will help families learn their options before they are placed, address their questions, alleviate concerns, and show how important resolving education issues um, are to the city. Our one suggestion is to amend this legislation to also require the education continuity unit be staffed during the summer um, or staffed adequately during the summer. And we also would suggest that all families with school aged children be required to meet with the educational continuity unit at the intake office so long as the unit is properly staffed and that it does not um, make the intake process longer. Third, increase the number and qualifications of educational specialists available to help families year round at their shelter sites and ensure staff have adequate supervision and accountability measures, similarly as mentioned. Um, fourth, improve and expedite transportation for homeless school children. Again, similar to as mentioned, the city should provide transportation to elementary school children during the eligibility process. At a minimum, staff should begin the transportation arrangement process during this time so that this process on average that lasts three to five weeks is not time lost. The city should also provide monthly metro cards rather than weekly for the parents awaiting transportation arrangements. We also believe the city should be arranging busing um, rather than just metro cards for the children attending pre-K programs. Fifth, pass legislation that requires the city track and report more data with regard to educational continuity for homeless students. Um, currently, the city provides very limited data. Um, CCC fully supports the intent of intro 1497. We urge the city council to pass and the mayor to sign legislation that requires data to be reported with regard to educational continuity, the number of days it takes to arrange your transportation to be arranged, absenteeism, attendance, and graduation rates. Local Law 142 of uh, 2016 is an educational continuity law regarding children in foster care. Um, given that the city's uh, administration for children's services has been able to produce the educational stability data requested in that bill, perhaps this law could be a good model for the similar issues for homeless students. Uh, sixth, baseline and add funding for social workers in schools with a high number of homeless students, as Randy mentioned. Um, we would like to see that funding baselined, as well as increased from the 43 um, to at least uh, 100. Uh, and finally, seventh, ensure homeless students have access to the services they need to be able to learn. Um, generally speaking, the city, including DOE, DHS, HRA, and DYCD, must work together to ensure these students have the supports in place these children need to be able to learn and succeed. This includes access to all services included in IEPs, as well as tutoring, clean uniforms, and mental health services when needed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you also. I just want to, an observation about the legal aid testimony. Uh, I think you were stressing about how um, stressful PATH is. I was glad to see the administration agrees with you on that because several times the administrator referred to this stressful experience that they have at uh, PATH. So at least on that we have agreement. So thank you for that. Uh, going back to the Advocates for Children report, um, I believe that we pulled a number that I uh, referenced today in testimony with the um, Deputy Chancellor that there were only 35 children identified as children in temporary housing who had uh, preschool IEPs. Uh, is that a correct number? And can you elaborate further on that uh, and just shine a light on uh, why that number seems to me to be very low? Yes, that number is correct. All of the data that we issued yesterday comes from the State Education Department SIRS, the Student Information Repository System. And so this is information that school districts across the state report to the State Education Department. We broke that out by grade level and for preschool we have students who are preschoolers with individualized education programs. And those numbers show that in the five boroughs of New York City, only, there were only 35 preschoolers with IEPs identified as students who are homeless. So just we think how many students citywide, UPK or pre-K, have IEPs? So pre-K is, is separate. There may be students attending pre-K for all programs who or have IEPs and also students without IEPs who are attending pre-K for all programs. In terms of preschoolers with IEPs, I can get you the exact number, but it's around 30,000. 30,000 and only 35 have been identified as being homeless. I will say we think that there are probably two things happening there. Okay. So the first is under identification of the housing status. 
of preschoolers with disabilities. So we feel confident that there are more children who are homeless with preschooler with preschool IEPs than 35. That that number is higher than 35. Um, we believe and have recommended to the Department of Education that they examine their process and develop a process to identify the housing status of preschoolers with IEPs similar to the process that they have and describe today the housing questionnaire that they're using in pre-K for all programs as well as with school age students. Um, but secondly, ICPH issued a report last year showing that children who live in shelters are uh, less likely to have an IEP by the end of kindergarten than children in permanent, in permanent housing when you look at students who ultimately get an IEP in elementary school. So is that so, because they're transient? So we think that that is for a few reasons. Um, and with respect to preschool in particular, the preschool special education process um, requires a parent often to initiate the process to write a referral letter. That letter goes to a regional office. The parent then gets in the mail a list of evaluation agencies and it's up to the parent to find an evaluation agency, schedule appointments, often get their child there. And only once that happens does an IEP meeting take place and then services are put in place. We think that there's a lot that can happen um, to streamline this process, particularly for children who are homeless. We want to make sure that children who are homeless are being identified as children who may need an IEP in their preschool years and are getting the support they need to make it through that process and make sure that they get evaluated, get an IEP, and get services. So it would seem to me, Randy, that as a former teacher, um, there's a ladder of referral for um, special education services. If a student is spending three months or four months in one school, that's actually not even enough time for a teacher to um, uh, address or to identify the special education issues that might be there if the child then leaves and goes to another school and then the other school would have to go through the similar process and then you know it follows it just keeps going on and on and on and um, and that's why I was really zeroing in on that number um, and um, and I think that also the way to um, help children with special education needs thinking particularly with speech needs is that you address them as early on as possible so that you can correct them um, and if that's not being done or if that's not being caught at the pre-K level, we're really losing a lot of time with these students. And I think by the second grade or third grade, we may have already lost them in that sense. I mean, we still provide services, but it's much more difficult, I think, to do it. You're absolutely right, and the research shows that the earlier you address a child's needs, the better their long-term educational outcomes. And ICPH looked at the specific data for this population in New York City and found the same results. I'll also just say quickly in terms of students, once they're in school, you're right. Once students are in school, there are still barriers for children with IEPs if they're switching schools and if they're not in a school long enough for evaluations to take place. We think the Department of Education did take a good step, which they mentioned today, of adding in some language to their standard operating procedure manual for students with disabilities to provide some guidance to schools. We think there are some additional work for the DOE to do there. For children who are not yet in school, this is another reason why having a conversation at PATH is important so that parents know that preschool special education services even exist. This is a reason why it's important to have education-based social workers at shelters who can not only address barriers for school-age students, but can help families identify children who may be in need of preschool special education services and help connect them with those services. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair Drum. Uh, and I want to thank this entire panel for uh, your very thoughtful uh, testimony with a, you know, a number of implementable recommendations that I think we need to really be, um, you know, I think in combination with the IBO report, you know, using as a foundational um, uh, a document to be able to, to um, go from here. One question that obviously a point that uh, uh, Giselle you brought up that's very concerning is this um, huge decrease over the last couple of years in uh, the percentage of, of families that are deemed eligible at PATH. What is accounting for that? Because that is obviously 
uh, terribly concerning. Um, it's not as if when the, the de Blasio administration took over, they were saying, oh boy, that, that path is really way too easy to, to get you know, housing from. Mm -hmm. um, so what, has, what policy has gone into place there that's causing this to happen? Yeah, so I, th I think in, in short, it's, it's a check on the front door and a check on the shelter census. I mean, to put some context on it, um, under the first months of de Blasio's tenure, the eligibility rate went up from what it had been under Bloomberg, which mm -hmm. was actually a very good thing in our view when we were seeing fewer families come into our office with these egregious problems being, you know, trying to be found eligible. Um, and at that time, the city had actually, th there, there had been a change in the state regulations overseeing the eligibility process that allowed them to be uh, more flexible. But I think at that time, this, it, the city realized that they were letting a lot more people in and um, actually approached the state and made recommendations for changing the regulations that oversee eligibility at PATH to make it uh, once again, more difficult for families to be found eligible and have to jump through more hoops. And so, so the that state reg now that that's causing this. Yeah, and so that changed. The new uh, administrative directive was changed in November 2016, um, and since then we've seen um, a continual decline in the number of families being found eligible and an increase in the number of problems that that we see on a daily basis in our office. So and that so that's. What is what is the what was the change exactly? Can you, can you speak to it? Yeah, I can send you the the ADM. It was a very uh, specific uh, language change um, that sort of governed uh, what housing options can be considered available, um, and it, it sort of made that language broader. Um, which allowed the city to sort of get away with saying this hop this housing option is available to you even if in reality it isn't. Um, so is this so like the definition of at risk of being home? Of, of, is that it's, at risk? It's the or? definition of a recommended housing option. Um, so the I'll send you the exact language. I don't know it off the top of my head, but it, it essentially mm -hmm. made that language um, broader so that the city could interpret it in a stricter way. And has the city, to your knowledge, so this has really been just since last fall. Has the city, to your knowledge, spoke to the, spoken to this issue, and and you know, I mean, or they say, look, our hands are tied because of the state regs, or do they feel like they maybe have some um, flexibility that they could assert? Um, we think they certainly have flexibility that they could assert. Um, they could, given that they approached the state to make the change originally, um, they could approach the state again, or they could also. Uh, <laughs> actually they, they admit that they approach the state. Um, it is our understanding that they approach the state. Right. Um, so when we talk to them now, they talk a lot about you know the different diversion efforts and prevention efforts that they're putting in, and all of those things are good, but um, it's still not getting at the root cause of the problem of a family who's coming in and actually doesn't have any of those resources available to them, mm -hmm. who needs emergency shelter, and who is forced to apply multiple times um, to either be found eligible or ultimately not found eligible and being forced back into unsafe locations. So mm -hmm. it, it hasn't been addressed to, um, in our view, uh, in a real way. Okay. I think this committee's gonna have to delve into this issue more in depth. Um, if, uh, just one question for everybody. If we were to try to establish some type of um, task force to look at uh, students in temporary housing uh, was that would that be something that you would think is valuable and would you want to participate? Yes, and yes. <laughs> yeah, no, we would always be happy to participate. Yeah. Great. I, I would anticipate as well. Yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Uh, Councilmember Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the panel for coming and for sharing. And my question is in the same vein as uh, Councilmember Levin's question which is you cited, I believe you said, the families that were deemed eligible was previously 60 something percent and dropped to 31 percent. So now you've indicated that in part that was because of the language that was used in the legislation by the state. So since we've now seen that there's been a change and you're gonna get that to us, what do you see as the trend since there hasn't been much time, I mean, perhaps about a year, but since November of 2016, what do you see now as the trend for families who are seeking shelter? 
It has been continuing to go, the eligibility rate has been continuing to go down since that change. Um, and I'll note it was an administrative directive change that was made at the state level at the request of the city. Um, so the city does have have some leverage over the, that administrative directive, and they also have leverage over their the frontline staff and how they implement that directive. Okay, and then um, in one of the one of the uh, reports of testimony that Sirit indicates that we need to increase access to permanent housing for families, and that is so obvious. You know, it's basic and easy to understand, and I support that. And it's one of the reasons why I vote against some of the projects that come forward to the council that do not, in fact, have provisions for formerly homeless to be a part of the housing that's being built or go down to 27 and 37 percent of the AMI. It's obvious. If you have a housing problem, you need to provide more housing at the levels where people who are now in shelters can be placed. And of course, I support your uh, position that NYCHA needs to be looked at as a source to provide some of that housing as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. OK. OK, well, thank you very much. And uh, that'll end this part of the uh, hearing. You want to gavel us out? Sure thing. OK. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, and now at 1.51 uh, p.m. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you all.